My name's Steve Fisher. Uh, I'm 73 years old now, next week. And uh, I was born in Carl Shorten on the 19th of February, 1951. I was born at home uh, because in those days, there wasn't many births actually in hospital. Um, in a big Victorian house where all my, most of my family lived. My step-grandmother lived downstairs with my two aunties and we lived upstairs uh, with my mum and dad, my eldest brother, uh, and because eventually I had a younger brother and a, a younger sister. My eldest brother has now passed, sadly. Um, but, uh, but the rest of the family, we all keep together. We meet once a year, we have a family do. Um, a darts competition at some anybody whoever wins the darts holds the the, the, the next year's do uh, and it's a big garden party and it's all the fishers uh, and other names now because some of them are girls that are now like my sister she's married and uh, of course we've got her own children uh, in fact her own grandchildren as I have um, so yeah you know and, and life was tough growing up we lived in, you know, we had, mum and dad worked, mum worked uh, part-time in Queen Mary's Hospital for children before they pulled it all down, uh, which was just up the road from where we lived. Uh, my dad um, was a driver uh, at uh, Clark's Bakeries at Hankbridge, uh, and he got promoted to supervisor because they brought in the HGV rules and he had to go on a course uh, to get the, his HGV qualification um, so that he could train all the other drivers, which was a bit funny because my dad never took a driving test in his life. When he was in the army and, and during the war, of course, it was a case of get in there, remove it, and it was, and then then you was a qualified driver, and that was it. So, um, so he got his license uh, and never took a test until he had to do this big thing for his company. So, and, and he, he did that for, for some years before he took retirement. Uh, and my mum, she used to work in the maintenance department at Queen's, Queen Mary's, uh, and she used to go around occasionally with the matron uh, and look at all the children, um, that some disabled, some you know muscular dystrophy and all that, of which I used to go up to Ward E10 with a couple of my school pals um, and we used to go and, and, and visit the muscular dystrophy ward, uh, the kids there, because most of them didn't have a long life. They, they died, you know, up to the, uh, before their 20s. Some of them managed to get to 24, 25 ish. But uh, we was going to uh, funerals on a regular, regular, too regular time. And uh, but, uh, but we, we, we used to do that, we used to go take them to their youth club. The other good thing about it was that um, once every other week, on a, I think it was a Wednesday, we used to go on a coach with the boys in their wheelchairs and we used to wheel them in at Crystal Palace. And because in those days, they all got in for free. And because we were pushing them, we got in for free as well. And we would be on, right on the touchline, you know, right there and uh, watching the game. Uh, back in the good old days, as they say, uh, which they enjoyed, and of course we equally got a kick out of it as well. We did, um, it became known, and I don't know how, um, but we used to go to, as I say, to this youth club with them as well, which was in the grounds of the hospital, and uh, the BBC found out about it, and they were doing a, a, a programme on it, and of course they filmed us all doing what we do, at this, you know, giving the kids a nice little rock, and you know, in their wheelchairs, and they loved it, you know. And uh, yeah, and, and that came out. I think it was on BBC Two, but uh, but that was back in that was the late sixties as well. So, uh, but yeah, we used to go there quite a lot. But uh, and tell us about your professional life when you. Well, my professional life when I first left school at the age of fifteen in nineteen sixty six which is, I'll remind you, it's when England won the World Cup. <laughs> and uh, I got a job in the bakery where my dad worked as an apprentice uh, maker. I had an apprenticeship. And, uh, but I wasn't there, for, I was there for just over a year. 
uh, before I, I chucked the job in because there was too many chiefs and not enough Indians. You had people walking around, keep telling you what, how to do a job and uh, you know, it would be the, the, the manager, the bakery, not the overall manager, but the bakery manager. Um, then you get the assistant manager, then the supervisor, then the charge end, and then there was you. And the, the silly thing about it was that whatever way you did it, it always turned out the same way. I worked with a, an old uh, master baker called George. He was well into his 80s. And, uh, and he used to decorate cakes. He was superb. He knew exactly. It was a real skill. Something that I could never do. You know, I did try a couple of times. but And I used to come and tell him off. I used to say to him, George, why do you stand for that? He says, no, well, I don't. He said, why? He said, he said they, they like to feel important. He said, and, and as soon as they'd gone round the corner, I'd go back to my way. And that's what he did. Yeah, he was a smashing old boy. So I gave that up because uh, machinery was coming as well. Uh, and I could see where that was going because all the time they bought this massive, great machine that actually um, only had two men to run it. Run it. One to put the dough in one end, one to turn uh, the, the um, tins over once the, the, it had all gone through the prover and everything else and risen. And, uh, and then he would then go to the other end um, and take the tins off. They would then go around a conveyor belt all the way around the, the, the factory, you know, the bakery. It would then go down to a machine to the next floor where it would go through a, a wrapping and cutting machine. And, and then you'd have another guy there, what they called the servery, um, would be putting these straight into their baskets, ready for delivery. You know, they'd, they'd go straight into the servery and then they would be loading onto the vans overnight. You know, so there was an early delivery roughly of about six o'clock in the morning onwards, uh, and that was that. But I left there um, because I could see where it was going. And uh, I went to, which one of the, my biggest regrets was I went to, um, it was called Youth Employment in those days, and I was walking down to go to see about getting another job, and I bumped into my pal, Dick Wilkes. I said, where are you going, Dick? He said, I'm going down to youth employment. I said, oh, so am I. We might as well walk out together. I said, he said, what, what, he said why, why are you going? I said, well, I've chucked in the bank there, so I don't want that. I said, it's not for me. I said, it's, you know, it's going, you know, machines, you know, they're taking everything over. So uh, I said, in a few years, it won't probably exist. It's certainly not how I know it. So I said, well, where'd you go? What happened to you? He said, I got the sack. I said, how did you get the sack? You worked for your dad. <laughs> so he said, well, he said, we fell out, he said, and uh, he said, it's a bit of me chucking the job in and a bit of him sacking me. So we went to there, and I, being the sort of guy I am, stupid, I let him go in first. So he comes out, he's got a ticket in his hand to go in for an interview. And so I, I he, the lady that was doing it pulled me straight in, so I've never had a chance to chat. And uh, we went through all these cards, and she's going through, and then she said, Plumber's mate. So I said, Oh, yeah, that's now, I could learn a trade. She said, Sorry, you can't have that one. She said, Your mate's just said that. And then, of course, I found out afterwards he only had stayed in that job for a week. That I mean, I was looking for a trade, and he took it out of my hands. And, so she said, but I've got a bakery job down the road. I said, I don't want a bakery job. No, she, she said, so she said, well, she said, it, it's still vacant. She said, anyway, I suggest you go and have a work with the, the proprietor. So off I walk up the road to, to Wallington. And uh, I didn't even get in through the door. I opened the door, I had the card in my hand, a fellow behind the counter said, don't tell me, youth employment they sent you. I said, yeah. He said, I've told them time and time again. He said, I filled this vacancy three weeks ago. He said, and they keep sending me people up. So I said, oh, great. He said, great. I said, yeah, well, I didn't want the job anyway. I want to get out of this side of it. So when I got back, 
She gave me another car. She said, one's just come in, Hamilton's down the road. So I thought, oh God, I don't want to, I want to do something different. So anyway, I go down to Hamilton's. I did everything I could think of to not get that job. And I still got it. I got a decent bit of money out of it. And I lasted three months, I think, before he sacked me because he could get somebody in to do it cheaper. And, uh, and then he sacked me and replaced me, funny enough, with a mate of mine who I met at a youth club the, the, the night that I'd been let go on the Friday. And, well, the morning, because I only worked up, because I started about five in the morning, which was illegal at my age. Uh, and I uh, used to finish about half 11, 12 o'clock. So he said to me, he said, Steve, he said, you're in the bakery trade. I said, I was. He said, well, I'm, he said, I've got a job. He said, I'm working. He said, I've got a job in the bakery. He said, yeah, what's it like? I said, well, I said, I've come out of it. I've been trying to get out of it. I said, where are you working? He said, well, I'll start Monday. He said, at Hamilton's down the high street. I said, I just, I've just left there. He said, oh. He said, so it's your job. I, I'm, yeah, I said, well, you're welcome to it. I mean, no problem for me. So I said, uh, well, I'll tell you now, I was getting, I told him what I was getting. I was getting about, I don't know, I think it was about £13 a week. It might have even been 14 So he said, how much? He said, he's only offered me £7 a week. I said, well, you've got no experience. <laughs> so... <laughs> He said, right, he said, I'm ringing him up tomorrow morning. He said, tell him if he don't pay me what he was paying you, he said, you should have the job. And that's what he did. He told me he didn't want the job. So I don't know what happened after that, other than the fact that uh, Mr. Hamilton wasn't a very nice man because at the end he held my P45 back and then that's when I went into the builder's merchant. Fortunately, they were nice people. And I kept, they say, well, have you got your, your, your P45? No, he hasn't raised it. And, he, and then the yeah, end, my boss, my new boss, rang him up and said, if you don't do this, I'm going to report you. You're obviously working a tax fiddle or something. And he came up the same day with it to the other shop, handed it in. But, uh, so that, that's where, where I got to there. I hated the bakery in the end. You know, it's, although I do bake it at home now. Um, you know, I'm quite, I'm quite, I'm not saying I'm brilliant, but I'm quite good at it. And uh, I... If I make a cake, it always gets well eaten, particularly with my kids, you know, when they call in. You make any cake, Dad? I'll come for a cup of tea. Previously to orders, I was working for a company uh, that sold fruit and veg. The name escapes me at this minute in time. Gerrard's, it was called Gerrard's. And uh, I worked there for a few weeks and the area manager came along and uh, saw what I was doing there, you know, that I was a quick learner, uh, and he made me a trainee manager. So I used to visit around other shops and that, and I, I did the job, um, uh, I filled it all over the place, actually. It was on the expenses, it was good. It was plenty of money, back, even back in them days, <laughs> and I'm talking must have been 19, yeah, it was 1968. Um, and I had a pal who used to come and lived across the road. We used to go to school together. And he worked at Alders. And he kept saying to me, why don't you come and work with us? So I said, well, no. I said, uh, you know, I'm quite happy with what I'm doing. I said, well, you know, what's so special about doing it? He said, well, I work on the vans. So I said, yeah, I said, I know that, Ron. I said, but... He said, well, he said, you'd be getting more money. He said, and you know you work five days a week if you want. He said, but obviously it's best to work the six days because the Monday you get paid overtime at time and a half. And I said, oh, so how much is that worth then? He said, nine pound a week. Well, that doesn't sound much these days, but, but that's what it was. Uh, so he, he arranged for me to have a, an interview with uh, the transport manager, who was named Mr Mitchell at the time, who told me, you know, because we, we were quite open with each other, 
that uh, he was only at orders learning the thing because his father owned a departmental store somewhere. He never told me where it was. Um, anyway, so we had a good chat and we, we got on and he said, when can you start? And I said, well, I can start, you know, I'm going to have to give a week's notice. I said, there's no way I would be dropping anybody in it because that's not my style. And he said, no, that's fine. He said, I, you know, great. So I turned up on the Monday morning on an overtime day and <laughs> I went straight to the personnel department who took me straight down to the dispatch department. And that was uh, Monday the 13th, 1969. I remember it so well because when I got down to the transport office or the dispatch office, the manager, uh, used to be known as Dougie, his name was Mr. Douglas. I never knew his first name, worked with him for a long time, but he was known as Dougie. And uh, he said something, they handed me over, he said, Ah, oh, they said, Ah, oh, you're the new lad. He said, Great. He said, Your driver will be in in a minute. So I said, oh, right, he said, just wait there. So while I'm waiting, this old boy in a cloth cap, who I then found out was George Rich, who was, a, who was a bit of a lad, you know, he was in his, well, he was probably well past retirement. He was just a spare driver. He used to, you know, go and do other little jobs. And he, he made me write. He said, oh, you knew, son? I said, yeah, of course. Now, bear in mind, this is just before my 18th birthday. He says, write your name down on this bit of paper. And he gives me a pen and a bit of paper. And I'm starting to write it down. And another fellow walks in called Billy Markham, who was in charge of the goods inwards. And he said, what are you doing? He said, he introduced himself, shook my hand, said, welcome aboard. He said, what are you doing? I said, well, this gentleman. He said, that's not a gentleman. He said, it's George. He said, yeah. he said he'll be winding you up forever and a day. He said, if you let him. He said, I don't. So my driver turns up and he takes one look at me. And he says, oh, no, he says, Dougie, he said, where's my porter? I said, thanks, that's, that's the new boy then. You, you, we promised you the new boy and you've got him. He says, I can't take him out. Look at the size of him. Well, you see, what Dave didn't know was that being in the uh, fruit and veg games, he was living, chucking about big, you know, bags of potatoes, you know, half underweights. And all. Well, prior to that job, I worked in a builder's merchant. And I was chucking around underweight bag of cement. So I was quite well built, but uh, I didn't have all this then. And, uh, and I had quite a lot of strength. So uh, he said, well, I don't, he said, no. He said, well, you've got to take him. He said, because that's all we've got. He said, I'll change him tomorrow. So me and Dave went out. We did a coastal run um, down to um, uh, Little Hampton, Bognor Regis and along that bit of the coast, the, the West Sussex, and, uh, we, and villages on the way down and villages on the way back. We didn't get back till about nine o'clock at night. And, uh, and we'd, let, you know, we'd loaded up eight o'clock in the morning. And he said, I'll see you tomorrow. I said, yeah, all right then. So when I came in the next morning, Dougie says to me, ah, he says, uh, he said, Colonel, he used to call him Colonel. Okay, Colonel, he says, uh, you're not with Dave Freed today. He said, you're with another driver. So I said, oh, okay. So he, he introduced me to this other driver, and I went off and I started loading the van with this other driver. Dave comes in, he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going out with this chap today. So he said, what do you mean you're going out? You're my porter. So he goes storming in the office. I followed him. And he said, I think, what's your game? He said, you get me a man in. He said, he said, and now you're taking away from me just after one day. So Dougie says, well, you didn't want him yesterday. He said, that's before I worked with him. He said, he's great. He said, he's tough, he's strong. He says, and that being shorter, he said, actually, he's an advantage when you're going up downstairs. He said, so I want him. He said, well, I'll take him out today. And I stayed with Dave until he left. And I uh, stayed in uh, transport, as it was then, for I think probably a couple of years. Yes, yeah, so when I joined the, the transport department as a porter on the land, I, I did that job, I think, for possibly a couple of years. And, uh, but I wanted to, at this stage, I, I wanted them to move on, you know, get inside. Um, but then they said to me, well, 
we've got this new rule come out that on the hired drivers or the hired vans, because we used to get extra removal vans and that and drivers, um, that uh, when we had sale times and that and there was extra stuff to deliver, and they said, but we need somebody to go out with these guys because they're not allowed to collect the cash on delivery money. It's got to be an oldest person. So I said, uh, so what are you suggesting? That you go out with these companies and these people uh, and you collect the money. I said, yeah. I said, well, that's all very well. I said, but when a driver collects the money, I said, he gets paid 1% of everything he has a commission. They said, well, we don't know about that. I said, well, well, I'm not doing it. If I'm not going to get the commission, I'm getting the responsibility. You don't want to pay me for it. I said, so no, you know, I won't do it. And they, they had a little chat amongst the management. <laughs> they said, oh, yeah, you give it to him. Yeah, he's entitled to it. Because that 1% that the driver used to get, when he got paid, he used to give the dust porters, whoever, you know, he was with, a percentage of it, you know, he, it might be five, ten pounds or something like that, which then again in those days it was a reasonable amount of money. And uh, so um, I agreed to do it. Um, but if you had any damage on your van, if you turned up at a house and you had furniture that was damaged, then that came out of your bonus. So, and you had three chances of that. Your first chance you would lose a third, the second chance you'd lose two thirds. If it happened within that month, you didn't get a bonus at all. So uh, it, it paid everybody to make sure they were doing the job properly. Uh, when I was doing on the, with the removal companies, they, they were great because they had a lot of better packing for the stuff to be put on their vans, you know, because they were dealing with other people's furniture mostly. Uh, so very never really got any um, things like that. But I will tell you a funny story about being on the vans. I was on a van with a, a guy called Les Nunn, who was quite a miserable driver. But I got on well with him. And, and people say, you with this? I went, oh, I feel sorry for you and all that. I said, well, no, we get on right. Well, Les was a stickler for checking everything before it went on the van. And, uh, and that we did. Anyway, we turned up at this house. It was a first floor flat. And I went up to knock on the door, as I always do, um, to see where it's going to go, you know, make sure there's no problems. So the lady said, yeah, he's coming into my front room over here and it's going in that, it's going in over there. But she didn't say exactly where it was going, it was just going in over there. So I thought, well, it, you know, this is the access that I'm bored about. So I thought, no, OK, we're all right. And it was a glass bookcase we were delivering. I went back down to the van and there's Les working away. He's got the old uh, beeswax and the colouring because he gets uh, off the French polishers that used to work for orders. And he's patching it all up. I said, that looks a mess. You never get away with that. He said, well, we said, you know, take it up, you know, and the lady can use it. Meanwhile, we might get her another one. So we go up, get into the front room, and I said, it's going over there somewhere, isn't it? She said, yeah, right over in that corner. She said, just hang on a minute before you move it. She said, can I just have a look at it? So we said, yeah, of course you can. So she looks, oh, she says, and all this marvellous. I bought this damage. She said, look, they've patched it up for me. She says it's going in that corner and that was where the damage was going anyway. So she knew it was already damaged. She bought it damaged. She got it at a good price. <laughs> We'd patched it up for her. Because <laughs> Les had missed putting it on the van. He put it on and he must have had his hand over it or something, you know, and not, not seen it. So, uh, yeah. And then um, from then, uh, doing the, the portrait, and I then eventually moved into the, the dispatch office as a clerk. And I worked in there quite a lot with Dougie. Yeah, so I moved into the dispatch office as a clerk. And my job was literally, we used to have to do the delivery sheets from the dockets that came down from the departments. And Dougie would work out the rounds and we would write them down. I was full time 
there was three other people that used to come in in the afternoon. Uh, Jim Pope, who was a retired ambulance driver, and two part-time ladies, um, Jean, and I can't remember the other one, James, at the moment. And, and they used to do, do the rest, but I, I would be doing those all days. But I had other duties to perform as well, uh, because I was there all the time, like sign for the dockets when they came down and that, and, uh, and make decisions at times. Uh, if Dougie wasn't there, he'd say, well, you can make the decision, you know what you're doing. You know. So I, I did that for a, for a, a, a bit of a time uh, and quite enjoyed it. The only, uh, the only thing was that um, one of the drivers or ex-drivers of one of the furniture companies, a company called Maple Leaf, um, which run out, I think run out of Norwood, um, became, got a job as manager of uh, the electrical warehouse, which was down at Queensway, just off the Pearly Way. And uh, he said, I don't know, he, he must have come up the store or somewhere. I don't know where. He might have thought, I don't know how it happened. He said to me, he said, you're a great worker. He said, we've worked together. He said, uh, I need a supervisor, he said, for the warehouse. I said, do you? He said, yeah. He said, and I thought, you? He said, I shouldn't have somebody I know. He said, I've got another supervisor as well. He said, so you both be supervisors, he said. And uh, he said, if you want to do it. So I said, well, what's it worth, you know? And he said, I think it was a couple of quid a week more, something like that. Anyway, the pay freeze was on. And because I was getting a promotion, I was allowed to have that extra money. So I went into warehousing and did that. I'd done it for a short period of time. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, we got most of the work done in the morning so that the afternoons was always relaxed. Get the orders out for the drivers that were gonna be turning up to do the deliveries the next day and, and that. But it was, there was no pressure. The pressure was in the morning, in the afternoon, it was beautiful. And it was great. And then all of a sudden, John gets a phone call and says, they want you up the shop. So I said, who wants me up the shop? They want to transfer you back to the shop. I said, well, I don't want to go back to the shop. He said, but they want you. So anyway, we used to have a controller. He was the manager at the time of Heavy Electrical. When, and then he became controller of all electrical, a bloke called Pat Pickard. And Pat used to come down to the warehouse from time to time to check on the stuff that had been returned damaged to make sure it was going back to the relevant manufacturers. And he was down there, he used to drive a, a Mazda car. I'd never heard of Mazda. The only time I'd heard of Mazda was when I was in the builder's merchant selling light bulbs, because they were Mazda. And that, you know, I never got over that. And John said, he's, he's wanted up the story. When are you going back, Pat? He said, well, he said, I've got to do a little bit here, he said, but probably in about an hour. He said, well, take him back. So that's what they, he did. He, he, took me, he took me back and uh, turned out Dougie had broke his arm. He'd been decorating. He was going to be off for six weeks. So I said, well, you know, what do you want me for? They said, because you're the only one that knows how to cube a van. And what that meant was, because of my experiences on the van, I knew exactly how much you could put on a van and how much you couldn't. They said, and we did have a person that was going to try and do it, he said, and we gave him up after the first day, because the drivers kept saying, I ain't going to get all that on. I'm not going to get all that on. So I said, well, but I'm happy where I am, you know. And I've got a title, and, you know, it's lovely. So they said, oh, well, you get a title there, we're going to make you assistant manager. I said, oh, yeah? So I said, well, what does that mean then? So they said, well, it's another couple of quid a week. So I said, all right then. <laughs> and, uh, so I became assistant manager, uh, and it was longer than six weeks because Dougie then, then, then had to have physiotherapy afterwards. And uh, being an older man, because he, he didn't heal quite so quick. But uh, I had to do the job, and of course, you see, I had to do part of the security as well because it's in the basement. 
and the, some of the vans didn't get back till eight, nine o'clock at night. And uh, I used to have to do the overtime on the clock cards. I used, to, I used to do them on the bus going home to Wallington, where I lived at that time. And, uh, you know, people were getting on, oh, hello, Steve. I haven't seen you for a long time. How are you doing? You know, and all that. Well, I'm just doing my overtime. <laughs> you know, all these pictures had to be in by a certain day, the next time the next day. And uh, so it, it became slightly pressurised, although I coped with it quite well. Um, and I did it for some, whoa, for some real time. And, uh, and Dougie had come back by this stage, so the pressure was off of me, but I still stayed behind at night to lock up. And uh, one morning, I couldn't get out of bed. I, was, I just couldn't get out of bed. And I thought, what's going on? So my mum comes in, you're late for work. I said, I can't get out of bed, Mum. She said, what do you mean you can't get out? I said, I can't, I can't move. I said, I can barely, you know, lift my arms. I said, I certainly can't get out. So she said, I'll get the doctor in. And the doctor came in, examined me. He said, what do you do? So I told him. He said, what hours do you work? I said, well, normally about seven in the morning. Um, so any time, eight, nine o'clock at night, you know. He says, how many times do you do that? I said, six days a week. He said, how old are you? So I told him. He said, well, if you want to live another year, he said, you want to pack that job in? I said, what? He said, it's killing you. He said, you're f working far too much. He said, you might think you're a young man. He said, and you are, he said, but you won't see old age as you carry on the way you are. So, because I had to go back in and, uh, and tell him, you know, I'm strictly having to stick to my hours uh, and I would be taking my day off rather than anything else. Uh, and that worked quite well for a little while. Then the Goods Inwards job came up uh, in the sub-basement. Um, Bill, Bill, I don't know if that was his real name, but he was known as Bill. Uh, his second name was Williamson, and uh, he'd done that for a few years. I knew Billy Marsden, who did it a few years before, who'd left the company. And uh, somebody said to me, you need to apply for that. So I said, well, I wouldn't think I'll get it. I mean, they got a supervisor there, you know, probably next in line and all that. Anyway, I did apply for it and I got the job. And... Uh, so I became the, the um, Goods Inwards manager. Um, and I did that probably for two or three years. Um, and meanwhile, um, I was in control of that. The heavy departments, your furniture, your heavy electrical and such, and small electrical windows included, um, bedding, they all had a porter in their department that used to come down and sign for their own stuff and take their own stuff away up in the lift to the relevant floor. And then this new guy started in stock control in radio and television. He came down to me and he said, when are you bringing up all my merchandisers down here? I said, who are you? He said, me. What should we be doing? He said, well, it's your job. I said, no. I said, it's the job, I said, of the porter for the radio and television department. He said, well, I'm the supervisor. He said, there's two of us. I said, is there? I said, how? I said, well, it still applies. I said, you come down. I said, not only do you come down and sign for it, I said, I'm prepared to sign for it. I said, and I'll get my supervisor signed for it, but nobody else is allowed to sign for it any anyway. rate. He said, no, 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 he started losing his temper and all that. Anyway, we had a little bit of a barney, uh, and then uh, we had a quiet little chat, a calm down little chat, uh, and then he found out after he stormed off and then came back that I was right. That man, I didn't know at the time, was probably going to change my life. Well, he did. 
That man was Terry Viviash, and uh, who was a nobody then, and became quite a, a force in the company, even though he didn't have a, well, he had a title of, I um, uh, can't remember what Peter Saunders gave him. It was to do with the staff. It was like staff welfare, ain't? but of course that allowed him to, to do the club and everything. Because at the, from that period of time, um, I was already sitting on the uh, staff, uh, the um, committee for the staff, you know, for the uh, entertainment. Because back in, I was already involved in that when I was in dispatch, uh, when I was an assistant manager. Because uh, the guy, Ed, I can't think of his other name, he came down to me one day and he said, oh, are you interested in football and things like that? And I said, yeah. So he said, good. He said, because we're looking for a manager to start the team up again because it's gone out the window. So I took it on. I took the team, the team on. They were called Commerce FC. They weren't called Orders in those days. They were called, I don't know why they were called Commerce, but that's what it was. I had uh, a lot of people playing for me um, that came from the store and came from group buying. And, uh, and a lot of them uh, were trainee managers. And uh, they did their bit. And over the years, they got promoted. And because I knew these guys, they used to play, they used to play for me. And uh, whenever they came round and people said, oh, you've got to be on your best behaviour, I say, why? Oh, one of the bosses is coming round. Who? Steve Shuman. Steve? Oh, he's all right. No, he's not. He's a hard taskmaster. <laughs> no, he's not. Because <laughs> I used to know him all. And they all knew me, you know, for, for years. So I had a good relationship with management all the way through. And, uh, you know, as it evolved, it was great. So, so with Terry, in fact, because I was already on, on the, uh, uh, the entertainment side of it, the committee, um, what we used to do in those days, because we didn't have a club in orders as such, we used to do two or three dances a year and we used to hire mainly the, what was known as the Awkward Ballroom at Purley, but other venues that were, you know, that were solely for orders, like a Christmas do and, you know, and a summer dance and, and things like that. Um, and we also used to run a footballing thing to, cause to give the money to, ch the, you know, a percentage of the money to charity. And the charity was Cottage Homes. And that is, it was always supported by Alders for many, many years, probably right up until the time they closed. They, uh, they took retired staff from orders and, and such sort of shops, you know, that dealt with linens and, and all that. Um, and, and of course, some of our retired staff got to the place. It was up in North London somewhere. I can't remember the actual name. It, it was called John something, I don't know. I did go there a couple of times because uh, we was invited to go up because we, you know, we'd meet the residents and that. Um, because of the amount of money that orders raised for them. Uh, so I was already involved in that and, uh, and the football. Uh, and as I say, they, so we used to do this thing every week where the first, you, you, you got some, you put your hand in the, in the thing, in the drawer, and you pulled out a team. And uh, I can't remember, I think it was something like six months in those days because we, we, we hadn't got to decimalisation then. And uh, I had two teams in mine. And I used to have to go around and collect the money from my area sort of thing. And uh, at this particular time, I had Dundee United and Dundee. And the first week that it restarted, because it had been won the week before, Dundee United had scored six and Dundee had scored five. Now you needed 11 goals. The following week, Dundee United scored five. Dundee had scored six. So, so I won twice, if you see what I'm saying. And so I won double the amount of money to share with anybody else that, that won it, but they, nobody else had won it. It was me. Just, I mean, normally this thing went on for weeks, but because if you went over, you started again, you know. And uh, 
It was, uh, that was quite an amazing feat. I don't know quite how I did it, because when I picked the teams out, I didn't want them. I thought, Scotty teams, what do I know about them? You know, but, uh, but no, it was paid dividends. So I, I did a lot of that. I used to, at one time, they used to, because the orders only subsidised the dances and that, we used to charge a, a small entrance fee to cover the rest of the cost. If we made anything over the top, that went into the pot for the charity. And, uh, and we used to have the, the uh, um, little raffles and, and all that sort of thing. So we another job would be going round and collecting you know, money for the raffle tickets and, and, that. and, and prior to that, going to uh, departments and find out what they got that they could put up as raffle prizes. Um, the chairman at the time then was a fella called Ed Percy and he was uh, in charge of menswear. Uh, and he was a lovely fella. Well, when they brought over, or well, they had to have, I believe it's a, it was a legal requirement, um, health and safety committee, um, they said to him, well, Ed, you're the boy, you, you, you're the one that was chairing meetings. We're putting you in charge of that. And so uh, we, uh, we uh, all got nominated, I got nominated onto that. So that was another job I had to do, health and safety, of which I kept doing all the way through until I went into my second lot of warehousing. Uh, and then when I left that, to go back, and I'll come on to that, go back to the store, um, which I didn't need to because there was already somebody in the process or doing it there. So, um, I forgot where I was. Oh, the club, uh, yeah, well, yeah, you see, well then, after my ruck with Mr. Viviash, we became very good friends. Um, we then, I think the people that were, in, that, were in, that were in the union, normally the boiler maker, the maintenance staff mainly, but there are others dotted around the store that wanted the union and that were in a union, that they try to push a union in. So what orders did the counter act it was to have a staff council. And uh, Terry, of course, got the job as chairman. And he was good at it, I've got to say. But to be on the staff council, you had to be elected. And because uh, I got elected. Um, and uh, every time it came up for elections, I, you know, I got it sort of thing. Uh, and from the staff council stemmed the Sports and Social Club. It was Terry's baby, it was his idea. You know, we started off, I mean, they didn't, management didn't want to do it. So, you know, they didn't want uh, having drinking on the premises and people, you know, to, as it was then, to up past 10 at night. And we was only going to do it for weekends. Um, but it evolved and it evolved and Terry made it evolve. I mean, to give you an idea, we were at the um, uh, meeting to say uh, to, that we had once a month to say what had been going on and what was coming up and bits and pieces. And uh, Terry got agreement to open, because it was only a, a Friday and a Saturday, Friday night disco and then a Saturday sort of a family sort of thing and after the close of the store. And uh, he got it to become every weekend, and and it started to grow. We even had a bar built in to the place, whereas before we just had trestle tables. We then had a bar put in, all, all organised by Terry. And uh, it grew and it grew and it grew. When Peter Saunders came along, well, we had a guy called Tim Daniels before because he was a fantastic managing director, Tim Daniels. He wasn't at the store, well, he, it was too short a time for me because he was that good, because he was even thinking of introducing a day off every now and again, not every week, for a member of staff to have a Saturday. Because everybody works Saturdays, you know. So, um, but of course he got headhunted, Selfridges, same as they did Roy Stevens, who was one of our previous managing directors. 
So I can see he went and we wrote from the start. I mean, it wasn't our position to do it, but we did it because we felt we had to. Um, we wrote to uh, Peter Slaymaker, who I also got to know quite well in my uh, job, various things. And uh, to say, you know, we were so pleased with Mr. Daniels. Can we have, we need somebody. We don't want somebody that's going to, we want a nice managing director. We want somebody that can, you know. And they said, whoa, we got this Mr. This Mr. Saunders coming. But no, they didn't mention who it was. They said we got somebody lined up for it. Uh, and we know that he would do the job and he'll be coming from head office. But it's not your concern anyway. This is our decision, not yours sort of attitude. So we thought, well, what are we going to do here? You know, who are we going to get? Anyway, we got a bloke called Peter Saunders. So Terry said to me, do you know about him? I said, yeah, I do. I said, when I was down at Hackbridge Warehouse, because when Peter Saunders came in, I was back at the store. No, I wasn't. I was, yes, I was. Yeah, I was down back at the store then. When I was down at Hackbridge Warehouse, we used to share um, the canteen restaurant, call it what you will, uh, with the buyers and the senior, some of the senior management, but most of them had, I think, had the boardroom there, they went in. And uh, the staff in the, in the restaurant, we used to go in first because we started early. Uh, and because the, the suits, as we used to call them, used to uh, come in that bit later. So their breaks were a bit later. So we used to come in and we would told, be told to sit this side. So we would sit that side. And the reason for that was they, they wasn't trying to be, you know, dismissive of us. There was a good reason for that. The reason was that when we went and the others came in, they could sit that side on a clean side. Well, they, the, the staff, would clean in that side. Which, you know, it was quite reasonable. But at any rate, I was the, when I was at Hackbridge, I was the assistant supervisor because I'll come on to what I did there and that, but because they got rid of the manager, made him redundant, and they couldn't call me a manager. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you about that story later. So Terry said to me, he said, so have you heard of this Peter Saunders? I said, yeah. I said, I know him quite well. I said, I don't know him. I said, I've never met him. I said, but I know his reputation. Apparently he's a right hard oh, nut. No. So Terry says, what makes you say that? I said, well, I had one of my lads. I said, was late unloading a lorry. I said, everybody else went to tea. So when he went up to get his tea, have his tea break, he was told that he couldn't sit at one side because they wanted to clean it. So he'd have to sit the other side. And, uh, and he took umbrage to it. And so I said, well, I can sit where I like and all this and, you know, and that. And so the uh, manager of, of the staff and restaurant, the canteen restaurant, reported him to a guy called Peter Saunders. And they said to, to this lad of mine, my fault truck driver, Mr. Saunders wants to see you, and he didn't know he was. So somebody escorted him to his office, took him in, and according to the fella, and I've only got his word for it, I've never asked Peter Saunders, I knew him quite well yet. Um, he said, I've got total respect for that guy. And he came back and told me the story. So I said, well, you got to I said, well, what happened? He said, he picked me up, he said, by the lapels, he said, and banged me against the wall and said, don't, ins don't insult or have a go at the staff in there, they're just doing their job. He said, if I hear you doing it, I'll be having words with you again. And he said, no, that's okay, I'll, I'll make sure I'll be able to sort of thank you very much. And when he come back and told me the story, he said, he said, the fact that he picked me up he bashed me against the wall. He said, I gave, he said, oh, I had so much respect for that guy, he said, because none of the others would have the guts to do it. He said, 
he said, and I will behave myself. I said, but you better. So, but anyway, so later on, when he, he came to the store, and Terry said, you know, well, we knew he was coming. Who is he? I told him that story. He said, oh, he's hard. So I said, no, he's not hard. Well, he was, he, was a, he was a director, I believe, at head office. Now, exactly what his job was, because the overall managing director of the company was Peter Slaymaker, who previously had been a uh, managing director or joint managing director at one stage with a guy called Roy Stevens. And that was in the days when I worked in dispatch and I was the assistant dispatch manager. Um, and then Peter Slaymaker got promoted to the buying office side, uh, as a, I believe it was as a director. And um, so Roy Stevens took over. Now Roy Stevens, everybody was frightened of him, but I got him again quite well with him. I was the assistant manager. I used to have to go up to him daily to get Petty Cash's side because um, some drivers, like we used to have firemen that used to come in and drive for us, people like that were just paid on Petty Cash. In those days, you, you got away with it. I don't think you get away with it these days. And uh, but that's the way it worked. And uh, so I got, you know, quite chatty with him when I used to go up and, uh, and all that. And I did him a favour because also when I was assistant dispatch manager, he rang me down one day and he said, have you got uh, anybody that can go down to Bopper Sutton High Street? and pick up some window screen wipers for my car. He had a company car, and it was a full Granada. And uh, I said, no. I said, well, what about transport? He said, well, we said he's off the transport. The transport manager had been off to have cataracts done. So, because he, he had quite bad eyesight because of the cataracts. Uh, and so he was off some time. He said, but there's nobody here. He said, it's only you. He said, and Dougie, you know that. So I said, I said, well, I haven't got anybody. It's all my drivers around. He said, well, can't you go? So I said, well, I can't. No, I can't. I said, I haven't got a car. I lived in Central Croydon. I didn't need a car. I said, I haven't got a car. So he said, well, we said, go down on the train. I said, well, you want me to go? He said, yeah. I said, well, how do I know what to get? He said, they, they, they're waiting for you. He said, just tell them, I sent you and they'll just give them to you. You've got to pay for them, nothing like that. I said, what about my train? He said, when you come back with them, he said, I'll come up and see me. He said, we'll do a petty cash and I'll give you your train fare. I said, okay. So I went down, I did it all and I came back. And then when I came back, took him, went up to his office and he said, oh yeah, he said, we'll do that. So we've done the petty cash. He said, now all he's left to do, he said, for you to go and put them on my car. <laughs> so that's what they're doing. And after that, we got on well. But because he was Canadian, I think he was Canadian, and uh, he got headhunted to Selfridges. And he came back some years later to say farewell to people that he knew, up at because the, the club was up and running then. And I was talking to him, and I said, uh, so what happened then? You know, why are you leaving? He was going to America. I said, why are you leaving? He said, well, he we said, I was sitting in my office in Selfridges. He said, I've got this phone call from this woman. She said, uh, we want you to come and work for us. So he said, work for you, who are you? You know. She said, well, she said, we ought to have a breakfast meeting about this. She said, so, you know, we'll discuss details. She said, but what we really want is you to become uh, the president of this set of stores or this business in America. So I said, well, is she in London then? She said, no, they paid, organised it all for me. Ticket, down to Heathrow, straight over, breakfast meeting, <laughs> straight back. He said, no, and he said, I accepted the job. He said, the offer was just too great. You know, uh, and that was him. He, so we, I, I don't know where he. I mean, he might even not even be with us now because he was a bit older than me. But uh, but he done very well for himself. When I first started there, there was a guy, 
that guy. He was the managing director of orders and his name was John Lawrence. His father originally owned orders before he became part of United Draperies. And I got to know that very quickly because I went in one morning to go and help a driver load up and there was this old boy, a really old fella, called Buck Johnson. And he delivered parcels. Uh, he was an old boy, but he could do 100 parcels locally a day, quite easily. And I went in one morning and he said to me, you play football, don't you? I said, yeah. I said, how do you know that? He said, because you've got footballers' legs. I said, oh. So anyway, so we're just having a little chat. Who comes down? John Lawrence, the boss, the, the big boss, who was aloof to most people. And Buck said to him, he called him some sort of nickname. And he was chatting to him. And off he went, oh, well, it's nice to see you, Buck. Oh, yeah, I've got to go. And off he goes. I said, you're a bit familiar with the boss, aren't you? I said, uh, everybody else is <laughs> all right. He said, well, he said, he said, I've known him all his life, he said, almost. I said, how's that? And he said, well, when the original Mr. Lawrence, he said, owned the store, he said, when John was old enough to come in, he said, he used to come out and do deliveries with me. I said, what, racing around? He said, well, we only had a horse and cart then. <laughs> he said, and, uh, he said, he grew up. He, he, said, he said, we're just good mates. And I said, oh, amazing, you know. Cause, and then I got to know uh, John Lawrence a little bit because when I was on the vans and I was made to go out with people, they were looking for somebody to go and do his shopping. And a guy used to be kept back to go and do his shopping with his, his secretary, he never went, on a Friday because he had a, bo uh, a boat down at New Haven, I think it was, um, where he used to go for the weekends, you know, when he wasn't working. And Mrs. Birmingham, and she used to say to me, come, come up to my office at 12 o'clock and we'll go shopping. We used to have to go around the wicket centre and whatever, whatever he wanted, he got. And we got these new uniforms, and, uh, which were quite not smart for, you know, deliver, for delivery people. And it, it, we'd only had them about a week. And I went up to the office, back with her carrying the shop, because I was just carrying the shop and she, she was the one that was doing it all. And uh, so I put it in her, her little office and she said, I've got you to him, Mr. Lawrence. Oh, lovely. She said, uh, Mr. Fisher here uh, took, you know, took me round and all that. He's, he's, he's new to doing this, is he? Because the other guy is not available anymore. She said, so we'll use him. She said, but look how smart he is. You know, he had the thing and the tie. He said, well, he said, he said, he always looks smart. <laughs> I don't know what to say. And off I went, you know. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, but he, he, and when I became the uh, good Inwards manager, he used to ring me down on a Friday. Fisher? Yes, Mr Lawrence. Uh, can you come up and get some bits and pieces? We're going down to the boat, straight from work. He said, can you come and get some bits and pieces? Uh, I'll send your boys up. I said, no, I'll come up with them, Mr. Lawrence. I'll make sure it's done right. And, uh, and we used to do that. And he rang me down one day and he said, Fisher, he said, uh, I've got a raft up here. He said, inflatable. He said, it's, it's OK, it's all packed up. He said, but I want it put on the roof rack. Now, somebody had put a roof rack on his car. He had a Rover company car. He, he didn't want to part with his old one. They had to talk him into getting the company car. You know, uh, and uh, so I sent up a couple of lads that were working with me at the time, and one of them was, I think his name was Steve, was his son. So he comes down, put it all on the trolley and all that, and I said, did your dad tell you it's got to go on the roof rack? So they said, yeah. So they carry it, and they, get, they don't just put it on the roof rack, they throw it up hits the roof rack, the thing with the roof rack goes off the other side of the car, 
I thought, oh my God. I said, did he say when he's coming out? She, he said, yeah, in about 20 minutes. I said, for God's sake. I said, who put that roof rack on? I said, well, who didn't put it on? So I said, quickly get some tools, put this roof rack back on and secured, and then put the, just got it on as he walked down. Oh, well done, Fisher. Thank you very much. Oh, well, uh, have a good weekend. And I thought not as good as you're going to have. <laughs> he used to get the, uh, used to, they, they used to make him a curry in the staff restaurant sometimes to take down on, the, on his yacht or whatever it was he had. And, uh, and he loved it. He loved it. He used to say to me, oh, if you get one of your boys to come up, tell them to call in and see her. She's, uh, she's done me a, a little something because he's asked to go, oh yeah, it's the curry, he loves my curry. She was German, so <laughs> she was all right. At one time, they used to make their own beds as well, apart from their own curtains and, uh, and linens, and you know, and, and house, what do they call it, house furnishings or something they call it, don't they? Um, they did all that at one time, uh, and they used to make them in the Canterbury Road warehouse, what was it? Well, it wasn't out there at the end, Canterbury Road Warehouse. And I'll tell you a little thing about the Canterbury Road Warehouse, which is good for your, your history lesson. When I first went down there, because we used to load at the shop, and then we used to have to go to Canterbury Road Warehouse to pick up bits of furniture and bedding, you know. And when we got there, you used to have to queue up, uh, and take your turn and go in. And there was only one side that was open. When we first went, went in there, I suddenly realised that the lift was all open, there was no gates, and it was all pulled up and down by hand, on a rope. And I thought, this is a bit antiquated. And because we used to go up and help them get the, the, the stuff out and put it in the lift and all that, and then they used to take the brake off and just let it run to the bottom, and just as it was getting to where it should be, you'd slow it up. And it was years like that, absolute years. And I thought, that's, that's all they got to use. And then I spoke to George, who was the manager there, who also had a house living in the grounds. Um, he said, there's one on the other side. He said, but you can't use that one. He said, because it's broken. And it was all overgrown and everything. That side. And it's only when they modernised it, they actually put electric lift in it. But yeah, just a little something there. And... Uh, the other goods in there, it was basically furniture. Furniture, furniture and bedding, that was all. Um, because the electrical stuff was at Queensway and then eventually went into Hackbridge. But then the bedding went into Hackbridge as well. Um, but so, I, so the orders in Royton was the, head, the headquarter and, and the warehouse, uh, no, the, the, the store? Yeah, the, the Croydon store, Everything that was in the um, Hackbridge warehouse, the Queensway warehouse, and the Canterbury Road warehouse was all orders of Croydon stock. It got more complicated a bit later on down the line. And I'll tell you about how I saved the... And the stock was, what, what kind of stock? Well, it, as I say, in, in Canterbury Road warehouse, it was bedding, it was mainly bedding and furniture. Uh, all types of furniture, of course, three-piece suites, chairs, bedroom suites, everything, you know, chest of drawers, tables, dining tables, and, you know, cabinets, and, and all that sort of thing. Um, at, at Queensway, it was electrical, it was all electrical, uh, heavy electrical mainly. Um, but then, of course, you see, they bought Hackbridge. And what they did with Hackbridge was, they put, and I don't know where carpets was at that time, they put carpets into Hackbridge, they put the heavy electrical and small electrical into Hackbridge and closed Queensway down, uh, and then they put bedding into Hackbridge. Now, I don't know, but it, it could be that it was a long-term vision by somebody, because then what it did was, it created just a one distribution point because they brought out, they bought drop body vehicles to do transfers between the warehouses to make sure all the stuff was there for deliveries. And um, 
which uh, that was one of the bad sides of, of orders. When I was this uh, uh, goods inwards manager, I say, I say goods inwards because one of the responsibilities was, was also the post room. There's one guy in there, been in there for years, and, uh, and I managed to get him a pay rise as well. When I was working there, you see, they, um, we had a guy headhunted from Brook Bonoxo. Don Ridgely's name was, came in as controller. And, I, and he, he said to me after he'd said, he came and introduced himself, did everything right. He said, me and you got to have a chat. He said, because you've got not a knowledge, I believe, about you know, the way that dispatch and transport run. So I said, yeah, OK. So we arranged to meet in his office. And I went in and he said, he said, I've been brought in from orders. He said to upgrade, he said, order distribution. He said to, to create and come up with some ideas about how we can do better and how we can do it cheaper. I said, well, you got a hard task, don't you? So, <laughs> so he was a nice fellow, we got a laugh. So we went through these things and he was saying, well, I wanted to do this. He was saying, well, I wanted to have two vans, extra vans, and have them going in between the warehouses, backwards and forwards, bringing stock to the store that was needed to be going to the shop for display and all that. So uh, I said, yeah. I said, you know, sounds like a good idea. And he told me lots of other things. And I said, and he's saying, can you see it working? And I'd say, no, because of this. Ah, but if we did this then and that, would it work then? Well, yeah, if you do it that way, yeah, yeah I, I would think so. You know, I can't see any reason why it wouldn't. And he did all this, he tied it, took, he, I think he was on the company about three months. So he went round everybody that did the job to get their point of view, to find out what the wrinkles were, you know, the things that would have to be straightened out for certain things to happen. And he was the one at the time said to me, he said, how would it work? He said, instead of having two lorries, he said, having one lorry, he said, we've dropped bodies. He said, the driver could then drop a body here, go down to the warehouses, you know, pick the other, the, the spare one up sort of thing, go down to the other warehouses, drop the body there, and then come back. By the time he gets back, they'd have unloaded the first body and reloaded it, ready to go. You see, and, and, and that was a good idea. And of course, after three months, they had a disagreement, him and the management, um, because they said, we can't do all this, it's too expensive. So he got paid off. He got £14,000, I don't know, because he showed me the cheque. Because I went and had a drink with him after he, he left. You know, just because he was such a nice guy. And uh, lo and behold, after he left, Within six months, they started inter introducing everything he'd planned. So they just used him, just used him. And I, di I didn't like that. I didn't like that at all. Um, and they, that's when the drop bodies all came into effect. But, uh, but no, he, 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 he was a nice and he was a genuine and he was a gentleman. And, uh, yeah, and I, I liked him a lot, you know, because he, he talked to the people that did the job. So often we get people brought into different... It uh, happened when I left orders. Um, they're bringing in people from university. They go there, they study for certain things. They come out, they don't take the jobs that they've actually been studying about, and they get put into jobs in positions that they know nothing about. And uh, it's a nightmare, and that's why it's all going wrong, in my view. But anyway, we're here to talk but, but about. You were there for like, 30, 30 years, I think. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, and, and it's also interesting because you you work your way up. Yeah, yeah, gradually, gradually. But I, but then I work my way back down again, and uh, and and I'll, I'll come to that. Um, so yeah, I I, I did the, the the goods in was and 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 the post room, um, and while I was there. While I took that over after, and bearing in mind that there was a pay freeze on, and I'd already had one, 
two, three pay rises in the pay raise because I got promotion each time. And uh, so uh, I did that job for a few years. Peter Saunders come in and that. We got on very well because we both into football. And, uh, and through Terry, Terry Viviash, because we used to do the things, um, he occasionally say, director's box, free up the palace, they're playing whoever. Sometimes it was Man United. And I thought, yeah, I'd like to have some of that. And he'd say, uh, go, he say, you know, if you want, you know, it's free if you boys want to use it. And we used to go, you know, take a day off. Well, Terry only worked in the, I mean, he worked during the day, but he never worked during the day Saturdays as such, unless we had something big on. He, he would uh, come in in the evening to, uh, to help with the bar, you know. But I'd say, oversee it, because we always had a, a duty member uh, um, on at any time. If Terry was away, I used to take charge. Um, we, we employed a, a bar manager, um, Brian, who was great. And I, because when I used to, I used to do the bar on a, on a, um, on a Monday night to allow the barman to, to be able to work Tuesday through to Saturday when we were open full time. And, uh, and so Brian, who was uh, uh, an uncle of a bloke called Steve Pennell, who was also on the committee, we were known as the Three Musketeers or something, I don't know what else that people called us. But, uh, and, uh, and I worked with Brian. Brian was a draftsman. Uh, and he, he packed it all in because computers were taking over. And that's why he, we, we had a bar manager and we got rid of him. Uh, and, uh, and Brian said, oh, well, I'll have that job, you know, if it's coming, if the money's reasonable. And he had a chat with Terry and they come to a deal and, and Brian took it over and uh, did a very good job as well. But I used to work with him on a Monday. And then because... <laughs> When I used to do it on a Sunday, when we started opening Sundays, Terry said to me, we've got nobody open, you know, to do it on a Sunday. I said, well, what time are you opening? And he said, well, we thought about 7 o'clock to about 11. I said, well, I'll do it. He said, you, you're a committee. He said, you, you do all these jobs. He said, you don't get paid for them. I said, no, that's all right, I'll do it. He said, no, he said, if you're going to do it, he said, you can do it regular. He said, and we're going to pay you. He said, the going rate that we pay everybody. So I said, yeah, OK. So we'd done a deal. Because we used to go abroad once a year to play football, we used to take both teams of one which I was in charge of with uh, Paul Buckworth, who was the uh, um, security manager. Uh, although he never used to go on those trips. I was the sole manager for my team. Uh, we used to play abroad, didn't we? we used to go to Holland or Belgium and play local teams. It was all done up and, and it was men only, you had a good time, you know, for about three days and uh, it was great. So explain this, uh, you had a, every evening you have a, had a slot for the people to gather and... Yeah, when... when, when and where was this? Which the, place was this? The bar grew, as I was saying, that's where I should be picking up really from. The bar grew and grew. To the extent where it was a little, it started with trestle tables, but eventually Terry got a, a corner with a little bar in it, so we didn't have to keep taking things out and all that. And where was this? Exactly? And that was on the top floor in orders. It was on the same bit as the staff restaurant. But just for the old, for the people in house. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was just all the staff. Mm -hmm. uh, they used to pay. 50 pence membership and uh, it, as I say with Terry it grew and it grew he took some real risks at times because he consulted me on just about everything I even was told things I wasn't even supposed to know uh, from above and because uh, he knew I could keep my mouth shut and he said to Peter Saunders, he said, you know, we need to have a slightly bigger bar. He said, we want to put on entertainment. So we did a bit of entertainment and he got to know about, you know, got to see it. And he said, this is good. 
He said, oh yeah, he said, we could do some charity, this is Peter Saunders now, he said, we can do charity dues up here, so you can do it you like. He said, you know, we'll do it. So, um, and it was all cheap prices because we wasn't allowed to make a profit. The profit had to be used, you know, which is how we managed to get the big names in. So, uh, as I say, the, the, the bar had to grow. And uh, Jerry said, uh, we could do with a couple of fruit machines up the club. We're licensed, you know, we, we can get a license for it. I've already investigated that. And he said, oh, no, no, we don't have them. He said, we don't want people playing them during the day. He said, no, they won't be switched on during the day. They'll only be used at night when the club's open. Anyway, they turned up these machines. I don't think they <laughs> come in, but, but they turned up anyway. So, uh, so we had two fruit machines that, uh, that made a little bit of money for the club. And uh, he said to Peter Saunders, he said, we need a pool table. So he said, what do you want a pool table for? He said, people will be playing that during the day and they won't be going back to the department. They'll come up for their lunch and then, then they'll forget the time. And so he said, no, oh, well, we won't use it during the day. And so where he where Terry was a bit of a chancer was the pool table didn't turn up. Two did. <laughs> so... I see you taking a chance. Anyway, he did, I don't think Saunders knew for a, about a month because he hadn't been up to the top floor at that stage. He used to go around a lot of the departments, but I don't think he used to go up to the top floor that much. And when he did, he, he went to the kitchens. He didn't go right the way around, so he wouldn't have seen him anyway. So eventually he, he did find, he said, attack, called Terry up. He said, what's going on? He said, I said, no pool tables. He said, and then you get two in. He said, he said, well, they're in now. He said, but we want to put one out. He said, we need to have an extension built on the top. So to, to go out and, and round into the white, into our cellar. So uh, he said, uh, no, well, he said, we can't afford to do that. He said, no, we'll pay for it. He said, out of the club funds. So that's what we did. We got our own builder in and that, got it all and you know, the architect and and so we had an extension which was not only the A pool room but it was also did the darts as well so that was brilliant um, and to tell you what a chance that Terry was and he never even told me and he told me most things if not everything we're sitting at a meeting and he said well he said we need to chill the, uh, the storeroom, where all the beer and everything's kept, it's, it's got to be kept to a certain temperature, really. And uh, he said, but of course, he said, I need you all to vote on it to whether we can do it. He said, the brewery will pay for it if we stay tied to them for two years. Um, he said, and that they will pay for that. He said, so it won't cost us anything. So we had a vote. This is halfway through the meeting. He's never mentioned it. Never mentioned it to me. I, you know, I mean, other than the fact that we really need one. And uh, he... <laughs> so everybody put their hand up. I, said, I think it said two people. He said, well, that's carried in. So I said, yeah, that's good, because we really do need that, you know. And uh, he said, good. He said, they started work on it this morning. <laughs> They'd already started on it two hours before the meeting. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, you're a chance. I said, but you're right. You know, we, we did need it. And we did, you know, it did. And the brewery did pay for it through what they called that Ullage or Nullage or whatever it's called. Because they give you a discount on beer barrels that you buy because there's, there's a certain amount of waste. And uh, so every now and again, they used to give you a barrel of beer Particularly if there's a new one come out. Oh, yeah, we give you one of those. How'd it go down? Well, they wasn't so, oh, well, we'll give you another one, you know. And because uh, we had to lose all this money at the end of, you know, at the end of the financial year. And uh, so what we used to do was we used to charge people silly money for chicken and chips, set out tables, you had to reserve them, and we'd get a show put on. 
we used to have a, a resident trio, uh, Martin Blackwell was the guy in charge, and Terry used to be his drummer on the cruise ships. And I never even knew Terry. And he used to say, oh, I used to play the drums. He went, oh, yeah, of course you did, you know. And on odd occasions, when we had a, a, a group up or a band up, we say, let Terry have a go on the drums. And they say, oh, well, we, you know, we can't just do that with people, and, you know, and the drummer likes to look after his drum, and all the excuses, which you can understand. And we used to talk to him, and Terry used to get on the drums. They'd start playing, he'd start playing. They'd leave him to play, and he'd be doing a so drum solo for about 10 minutes. And then they'd you know, be saying, come on. And they'd go off just to, to finish it off. And he, he went down a, a, a real treat. And uh, so we used to get it, him to do it a lot of the time. But uh, I had the uh, good fortune to uh, look after the axe. And we're talking about <laughs> Roy Castle. He did a manager's do, a manager's Christmas party. Nobody, but nobody, even my, my immediate boss, asked me who it was going to be. I said, I don't know, but I did know. There was only Peter Saunders that knew, Terry Viviash and me. And Terry said to me, he said, can you get up early? He said, because you need to have to check over the lighting and all that. So I said, yeah. I said, uh, I said, he'd be good, that Roy Castle, you know. I said, I've, I haven't seen him live, but I've seen him on the telly. I said, and my dad used to have a chat with him when he used to deliver bread at Sutton, when he used to come from Harry Seacombe's house to get on the train to go to London for some reason. So I said, his pal, he's a very nice bloke. So I said to my boss, I need to go up and do this, uh, do the lighting early to make sure the bulbs are working and whatever. So he said, yeah, yeah, yeah go on. He said, you can do it anyway. He said, don't matter. He said, you're so willing to talk. There's no point in saying no. So... <laughs> Up I go. I get the big ladder out, the big steps, and I'm up there and I'm changing this bulb. Also, I get this on the back of me trousers, and I'm thinking it's one of the lads having a laugh. I look down, it's Roy Castle. I said, get down, hey. I said, hello, Roy. I said, are you here tonight then? He said, yeah. He said, I want to, he said, I know where Terry is. He's come to, to, to have a quick chat. He said, Peter's just sent me up, he said, to go. I said, well, I'll take you in. He said, just round the corner here, down that alley, down that corridor. So he said, no, 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 he said, I can see you're busy. I said, no, it won't take a minute. No, 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 he said, you just tell me where it is, I'll find it. So I said, oh, and anyway, as he, he got off the stage, because I was on the stage, he sort of looked at me and he said, hang on a minute. He got back on the stage and he just, a little bit with his feet. He said, this is great, this stage, he said, for tap dancing. Can I do tap dancing tonight? I said, Roy, well, you're the star. You can do whatever you like. So uh, he, he went off to see Terry. I get a phone call as the place is filling up. Uh, we got Roy Castle down, who's got some equipment he wants brought up. So I went down to get, because I was going to be looking after him anyway. And uh, took a barrow down, loaded up his, his, his uh, stuff, trumpet and all that, all in cases. And uh, brought him up, took him to, we used to use the uh, medical room as their changing room. Took him in there and all that, he got changed and everything. I took all the stuff around onto the stage. He said, can you just undo the catches? He said, don't open them. He said, then, then I'll work through them as and when I want them. So I said, yeah, no problem. So that's what I did, did all that. And uh, he didn't want much any rate, you know, in terms of looking after. He, he, some of them get a bit, I'll tell you about the worst one. And uh, he, came, he went to come on. We had uh, the Martin Blackwell trio, as it was called. Uh, they ended doing a bit. We had... Um, uh, Somebody else, I think it was a singer, did a couple of numbers, and he came on. Oh, he went down like a house on fire. He was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And uh, he can't, he's, he, I'll never forget his starting joke. He had a dig at the G 
Jeff Eaches, who was the services director. Jeff was known as being tight. He never spent any money, particularly his own, but certainly not the company's. If there was a way of getting out of buying something, he would get out and doing it. So <laughs> Roy goes on and he's, you know, got a big round of applause and, that, and he, he said a couple of things, you know, it's nice to be here, you know, all the usual standard stuff. And he said, oh, right, it's Jeff. He said, hello, me and Jeff. He said, oh, we're great pals here. He says, oh, I remember when we first met. Do you remember, Jeff? He said, uh, we were both swimming under a toll bridge. We bumped heads. <laughs> so that's how tight he was, you know, it went down absolutely beautifully. And uh, he was great. I helped him clear his white stuff away, put it all on the trolley. He had a couple of chats with Peter Saunders and a couple of the other directors and with Terry. And then he said, right, he said, I've got to go. And uh, I took his stuff down with him. Opened up his, I think he had a Rolls Royce. It might have been a Bentley, I'm not sure. He had a big boot at any rate. All this stuff just fell in. And uh, as I closed the lid and went to get the trolley to take, it, to take that back in, he got some money out of his wallet. I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, he said, I thought I'd give you a little drink. He said, you've worked hard tonight. I said, no, Roy. I said, I don't take your money. I said, I don't want your money. I said, if you're going to insist, I said, I still won't take it. I said, but you can do one thing. I said, the next time you go and do a gig for a charity, I said, because I know you do a lot of that work, I said, just stick something in the box from me. And that's what he did. You know, smashing guy. Smashing guy. And, and this kind of work you did too? I did that for... from your job? That's what your leisure time is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't get paid for any of that. They, they, any of like those jobs. I mean, I used to get a free taxi home, and uh, as did all the bar staff and everybody, you know, or, or anybody that worked up there got free taxi, unless they went early. You know, like the catering staff, they would, they would get paid, um, but they, they wouldn't get a taxi home because they would be leaving, you know, early, halfway through the night. And, uh, and but, how many people was this event? Well, it was all the managers and the controllers in, in the store. There wasn't any outsiders there. There wasn't wives or anything like that. But when they do the, 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 sorry, the store stuff, the people working in the stores, they weren't there? It only if they were working as waitresses and, and behind the bar, um, because, um, you know, that's what they were employed to do. That, that gave them a bit of pocket money on top of their wages, if you like. And because I don't think they paid tax on it. But, uh, well, I don't know, it was up to them to declare that. And uh, so, you know, we used to put on these shows and great, great nights, had great nights. We had Bernard Manning up there. He was absolutely brilliant. And uh, we had lots of different people. And um, I suppose the, the biggest name we possibly had was Bob Monkhouse. And I had to look after Bob Monkhouse and get him in, get him changed, show him, you know, where he'd have to go on and all that. And I was chatting to him and that, and, and we had, at the end, we went on to the stage to come round behind what we called the TARDIS, which was where all the controls were for the lighting and the sound and everything, which we had built ourselves with the in-store workers, the, the chippies and the... Yeah, we had two go electronics guys that come in and done all the, the electrical stuff because obviously it's a specialised job. And um, so you, you came in behind the curtains that were drawn because that was the rest area for the, the restaurant. So if you had a meal and you wanted to go and sit in a nice easy chair, there was a place for that. And he was behind there with me. And uh, he said to me, he said, you can leave me now. I said, sorry, Bob, I can't. He said, yeah, no, he said, you can. I said, I can't. I said, I'm not allowed to. I said, I have got to be with you all the time until you go on. I said, and then when you come off, I've got to be with you again. I said, that's my job. I said, it's insisted on by Terry. I said, uh, we don't leave anybody to, to fend for themselves. We're here to help. 
So he says, well, don't talk to me. He said, just leave me. And he started walking up and down behind this curtain. And he's talking to himself. And I thought, he's a bag of nerves. I went down to Terry. I said, he said, what are you doing down here? I said, he's a bag of nerves. He said, oh, I don't care what he is, he said. He's under contract and he's going on. <laughs> so he said, get back there. I said, well, what do I do? He said, do what you're supposed to be doing, keep an eye on him. So I go back and he's going up and down and he's talking to himself and he's all oh, right. Anyway, we had a compare comedian on that night as well as I think we had a couple of singers as well. And he done the introduction. He, because they do, I um, uh, can't think of the word to call it, when the, an act is closing, the. Oh, I had the word then, I lost it. In their closing bit, tabs they would do what they call tabs and what that is is they would tell everybody not the audience but all us that are involved what the tab is I will say such and such and that's when I'm coming off that's when I'll be introducing the next act so of course Bob's still walking up and down here I hear the tabs and I thought what is going on so he does the introduction the star of the show, Mr. Bob Monkhouse. Now, what Bob has done, now this is quite a long area, he's walking up and down, it's longer than this. He, he times his run. When I say his run, he's walked. He's turned, he's now coming down towards the, the entrance to get on the stage. And just as the father's saying, here's the star of your show. He went, as he said it, he stepped on the stage and went on. The father came off. Big round of applause, he went bang, bang, bang. And the rest of his history, he was unbelievable. He was so quick. You can't remember half of what he said because he's so quick. And it was a great night, everybody loved it. Everybody. But uh, as I say, we did all the charity shows, we had big people up there. And, uh, and uh, I never did get the chat to him, which is one of my biggest regrets because I was always too busy. There was a, an actor who used to come up with his beautiful wife on all the charity dues, and uh, his name was Melvin Hayes. And a lot of people know him because he was quite famous in as much. He used to be in the series on the telly called It Ain't Half Hot Mum. And it was about a group of theatrical people going around entertaining the troops. Uh, he was, I think he was known as Gloria. Anyway, I did a, we did a, um, a presentation stroke charity do, just a, not a big, not a big thing. And he was there and he agreed to do the raffle. And I had to do the raffle. I didn't have to, but I was chosen to do the raffle, to hold it, uh, for him to do it. I got a photograph of that at home somewhere. And, uh, after that, every time he came up, he used to almost sit in the same position. Um, I used to go rushing through, and he'd stand up to say hello. And, you know, and of course, I had to go whizzing past him every time because I was doing something urgent that had to be done there and then, you know, couldn't stop. And it, it happened so many times. And uh, even when I, um, one of the dudes, he, he went out, he, he was queuing up to get his wife's coat. I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I've got my ticket. He said, my wife's ticket. He said, his wife was very, very attractive, very pretty. And uh, I said, give it here. I went in, I got his coat, and well, not his coat, his wife's coat, and took it out and said, right, you get off, you know, and all that. And that's the only words I spoke to him. You know, because that's the only time I had a, you know, conversation. And I regret that, because, uh, you know, I, I know me and him, you know, could have got on quite well. And uh, now I don't know if you've noticed that my accent or the way I speak, we used to have our own guy that used to get us all these acts, um, Victor Seaforth Agency, Victor Seaforth. 
he was our, our agent. And he said to me one day, he come up the club because he was organising somebody to come to us with Terry. And he was coming up because he'd got the decision and that and he'd got the contracts and whatever. So he said to me, he said, I've got a, he said, I've got a mate, he says, in London. He said, all he does, he says, is sound alikes. He said, they use people for doing it for adverts and that. He said, has anybody ever told you, he said, that you sound like Bob Hoskins? I said, many people, when I've served them in the store, don't you sound like Bob? He said, here's his phone number, give him a ring. He said, because he'd love to talk to you and he can put a lot of work your way. I said, doing what? He said, doing voiceovers, doing adverts. He said, they don't want to see you, they just want the voice. And I said, well, I'll think about it. I shoved it in my top pocket and never bothered, really. Yeah, I wasn't you know, that bothered about it, but it was just that everybody, you know, kept saying, oh, do you know, you know, and uh, in fact, when I was working on the buses up in Northamptonshire, after I left Alders, that uh, some of the other drivers used to call me Bob. <laughs> or London, that was the other nickname I had. So uh, that, that, that was, uh, that's how that worked. Um, but yeah, the shows we put on, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you about one more, because this is big. We had a group, uh, a 60s group, um, called Georgie Fame and the Blue Fames. Now, I don't know if you know them. They come up as the 60s band, Georgie Fame and the Blue Fames. We had to get a specific type of piano in for... I won't say Georgie, I will tell you, uh, well, uh, when the road, roadies turned up with the rest of the equipment, I said, there's, I said, there's Georgie's piano, it cost enough to hire. He said, God's sake, he'll be along soon. Don't call him Georgie. He hates that name. I said, well, what's he, what, what do we call him? He said, Colin, I think it was. I said, oh, he said, well, we said, that's the name he goes under. So anyway, they put all their gear out and they positioned this piano where it's got to be. I then put the stall up to it and that's it, you see, walked away, was doing other things. Suddenly so noticed the stall's missing. So I look around and I find tucked around the corner the stall, so I put it back. Five minutes later, I see this fella picking it up and taking it away. I said, where are you going with that stool? He said, he won't use, he won't use this. He, he brings his own. He said, we've got it, he said, on the van. He said, we'll be bringing it up in a minute. I said, oh, OK. I don't know, 15 minutes later or so, I look over to the piano. What's in front of it? Is a milk urn with a cushion on the top. I picked hold of the fellow that's in charge of the roadies. I said, what's going on? I said, with that? He said, that's his stall. I said, that's his, I said, it's a milk urn. He said, well, he runs a farm. He said, and he, one day he said, he was sitting down, he said, and he thought, oh, this is about all right. He puts a cushion on it and said, this is perfect. And that's how he, he got this thing, you see. We did the show, went down a bomb. Clive, that's his real name, Clive. You can only call him Clive. So he says, and it comes over to Terry, and he said, Corey cool, said, he said, it's really nice doing up here. He said, he said, we're doing a, a trial thing, he said, we want to do it. He said, with the BBC. So Terry said, what's all that then? So he said, we're doing a show that's a tribute to Hoagie Carmichael. He says, I'm doing the vocals. He said, and the guys that are doing the instrumental play are the best that you can get in their field. So 
the trumpet player was going to be the best trumpet player the, and, and all the other guys that were doing it, you know, was going to be the best at their field. He said, would you be interested in doing it up here? So he said, Terry said, well, yeah. He said, I don't mean just doing it, he said, but really professional. So he said, yeah, we'll give it a go. You see, it's only like a pilot, he said. So anyway, the BBC contact Terry, come down, visit the place. This is it. Oh, yeah, we can put that there, put that there. Anyway, on the day that it's happening, all this equipment turns, well, no, the day before, all the equipment turns up. Terry's got all the paperwork. He says, you're on that spotlight, eh? Spotlight? Yeah. I'll let you know when you've got to come in. We'll be operating the actual thing. You've just got to make sure you're pointing in the right direction at a given time. Here's your instructions. And everybody was up. I mean, none of us were professional at it at all. And we did it. And we pulled it off. We got letters from the BBC saying how marvellous and all that. They recorded it. They didn't record it there. Well, I don't think they did. Uh, but they did. Uh, they actually recorded it at one of the studios and uh, it went out on BBC Two, exactly as we'd done it. And, and that was a feather in our cap. They called, the, the, the not on the night, it was called, I think it was called Tobacco Road or something, but that was just a, a name they chucked in. Uh, but it's out on video, uh, the original uh, that they've finalised, and it's brilliant. And then I, I keep meaning to get the tape. That was some years ago, and I still want to get the tape. I keep telling the kids. When was this? What? Oh, this was years ago. This was probably about late, maybe late seventies, early eighties. Yeah, I had all the paperwork for that, but when I came off the sports and social club, I eventually gave it up. Um, and I, uh, I handed all the paintwork over to the person that was taking over from me. So, uh, but it was all in there. Even, even the thank you letters from the managing director, Peter Saunders, uh, and from the BBC and, and, and everything. It was really a big, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't think we could do it, to be honest, because we were and, amateurs. And this show was for the uh, older people who were employed? Yeah, well, yeah, there, 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 there was, it, was, it was staff that came in for that. Staff, and how many people were there? Uh, I don't know, probably a couple of hundred, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, it went down, it was magnificent, absolutely magnificent. I was so proud of that, really proud that we all done so well. You know, we were amateurs, you know, we'd, we'd never done anything like that. Yeah, we put on shows, we'd have one bloke controlling the lights, you know, sitting in the TARDIS, controlling the music and the background, and then we'd have a band, you know. But we didn't have to do too much, just organise it. But that, we had to be involved in, and it was brilliant. They loved it. They loved the shows. People outside got to hear about them. They wanted tickets, and we say no, staff only, because we had enough staff to be able to, you know, <laughs> put the shows on. Well, I say, we probably averaged about, it may be more. I never actually counted, but at least 200. Yeah, but, but there was 1,500 working in the store, although they weren't all, all the stuff. Some of them were concessions, like um, fashions, like Alex and fashions. They had a manager there, but it wasn't employed by, all this was employed by uh, Alex. People in the department where I ended up in their electrical, we had demonstrators, they were all employed by their companies, Bosch, AEG and wherever. Um, although they were still entitled to go, um, but, uh, and some of them did, not many, uh, but it, it was nearly always all the staff. Well, in fact, always it was all the staff. But that's what brought everybody together. And the fact that Peter Saunders at the time let these things grow and got involved with it by saying, well, you can do this charity. Because he was putting his name out there as, as, as the the organiser of the charity, you know, charity dues, which he wasn't. He used to say to Terry, this is what we're doing. <laughs> get on and get it organised, you know. And uh, and because and Peter would take the, you know, he had to, he always had to have his permission 
to do these things. Um, but um, but he used to just let Terry, he made Terry the entertainment manager or an, another title to that effect, full time. And uh, and what with the uh, the staff council and the, the sports and social club chairmanship and and the uh, uh, the other thing, the, the big committee that we had, um, staff council. And because the staff count, you see, the other committees all were under the umbrella of the staff council. The staff council was the main committee and everything else ran off of that. And uh, so it worked quite well. And what, what do you thought, what, what do you think the employees thought about having an employer like all of us at the time? Loved it. Oh, they, every, I'll tell you a little story. When Alders was going through some hard times, as they did now and again, which is what eventually closed them. And that's not because of the hard times, that's because the people that owned it at the business at the time. Because they never knew anything. They were builders, they knew nothing. First thing they did when they came in was get rid of most of the buying office, most of the middle management, all people that had been in the business for years that knew how to get past that these bad times, we did it time and time again, uh, they got rid of. And so it, uh, that's the reason why I left, because it was going nowhere. You could see it was going down and down. And I said to a pal of mine, I won't be here next Christmas. He said, of course, will you be here years? I said, no, I won't be. And I wasn't. And because within two years after me leaving, and I'm not saying it's because I left, but it was because of these cowboys that uh, also went out of business in the end, um, they destroyed orders. They destroyed it. Orders could have still been there today had we had the old, the proper team, what I call the team, the people that lived for the business, knew all the answers, and if they didn't know, they'd find out. You know, they were more interested, you know, in keeping it going. But, uh, but they got rid of those people and they took the heart out of orders. Everybody, when I used to call back in to see some of my old colleagues, they never had a smile on their face, and it was so oh, distraught, absolutely distraught. And I said, you know, this is, I'm glad I went, because I went when it was still reasonably good. But when we were going through the hard times, th there's not, a, I don't know of anybody, and I knew a lot of people in orders, obviously. I don't know anybody that wouldn't have given up a day's pay for Peter Saunders. Governor, we'd come in, work for nothing. Because he was that good. He was that good. He knew everybody by his first name. I was talking to a pal of mine yesterday, I used to work with Ray. He lives in Seaford now. And we, his wife died a few years ago. And uh, we see each other a couple of times a week. We go out for a bit of lunch and that. And he was saying, we talked about Peter Saunders yesterday. And he said, what amazed me about that man was, he said, I come into the store, he said, I'm only there on my first day. He says, he comes walking through, he spoke to you, he said. I said, well, that's because he knows me. <laughs> he said, but then he came over, he said, oh, he said, yeah, you're new. He said, and what's your name? So Ray said, oh, Ray Wright, he said. Oh, yeah, well, that's, welcome aboard. Every time, and he did this with everybody, not just Ray, Every time he walked through the department, he'd say, hello, Ray. He always used to call me Stephen. He used to annoy me. He never called me Steve, because my mum was the only one who would call me Stephen. And when I <laughs> it's because I was always in trouble, though. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but he always called me Stephen. And, uh, <laughs> but he knew everybody's name, everybody. Didn't matter. If they worked in that store, he knew their first name, and he used it. The staff loved him because he was so good, he was so friendly, you know, and uh, he, although he was the managing director, he, I think he saw himself as being the team leader. You know, it was a team, you know, and uh, he, he, he was amazing. He, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that if it had come to it, you know, we'd have worked, all work, we'd have said, yeah, boss, we'll work, but, we, you know, we'll miss a day's pay just to keep the company going because of you. 
he, he, he was great. But I'll tell you something funny about Peter Saunders because me and him were both big into football. And I was a qualified referee at the time as well, as well as running the one half of the football team. Because his stepson is a, 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 a sort of famous footballer. He did play for England a couple of times as well in the World Cup uh, when it was in Spain. But he used to come along to me on a Saturday. If he's working on a Saturday, because uh, I was the um, administrator for the computers in my department in every lecture when I got there. He'd say, uh, what's the football stores then, Stephen? I don't know, Mr Saunders. Yes, you do. What are they? Look, these computers you're not allowed to use to go and you can't do anything because they're all in-house computers. Yeah, he said, but I know you do. What's the school? How's Brighton getting on? How's Palace getting on? And uh, I say, well, I don't know. Yes, you do. And I, cause I, oh, yeah, well, they're winning or they're losing. Oh, or, oh they're drawing. I say, no, you've been told. I said, no, I never showed you that. Uh, yeah, we got. So he says to me one day, we're upstairs, we're doing a, I think that was a charity do. It was a, it was a, uh, wasn't a, a big, big charity do, so like some of the ones we did. This one was more of a, a low key. So he comes over, I was talking to Terry, and he comes over to me and he says, oh, Stephen, he says, I've got somebody I want you to meet. So he said, I said, oh, have you? Yeah, he said, he said, uh, You'll know this fella, he said, he's a uh, place for Crystal Palace. I said, oh, does he? So he can't be that good then, can he? So I go over. He said, Steve, he said, Stephen, he said, meet Dave Swindlers. So I said, hello, Dave, how are you doing? Hello, Steve. What he didn't know was I used to run one of the kids' teams down at Coney Hall in West Wickham. And my pal said to me one day, he said, do you know, he said, Dave Swindler's only lives just out there. He says he's just moved into the area. He said, do you think he'll come and do some coaching with the boys? I said, don't know. So he said, he said, I thought about dropping a letter through his letterbox. So he did. And Dave responded and he said, yeah, I'll come and coach some of the boys. And he used to coach my youngsters, you know, when he could. And uh, and uh, coach my uh, pals and that. He couldn't do because we had about five teams, different age groups, and uh, he couldn't do them all. So he, so he concentrated on, on my mates and mine, and because I knew him. And that's why <laughs> I got that one over on him, because <laughs> he was always, he was always picking out people because of the footballers. He'd say, uh, oh, meet this one, and I'd say, yeah, I already know him, <laughs> do you know. But your idea about the downfall of all those yeah. was, Yeah. People don't buy anymore no. in this kind of store. No. Or no, that didn't help. That didn't help. Um, and I can, I can prove that wouldn't have helped the way things were going was because many years ago, we actually tried to buy Debenhams when it was Kennards. As Alders Group, we wanted to take that store on as well. Uh, and we didn't, we, we fouled in the bid. And uh, what was I going to go on to? They were, we had, as I said, we had all these people that were really good in the business, really knew what they were about. And um, when they redeveloped what was Kennards and made a shopping centre over there and did it all and that, our trade dropped. We thought because we was the only departmental store and Electrical in particular, we, you know, everybody was going to be coming to us, weren't they? Because we were the only ones there. Because the, the electricity board had closed or was closing, uh, we were the only ones there. There was nobody else about. There was a little corner shop, uh, Wellesley Road, I can't think of the name of it. They did a bit. And, uh, but it didn't, didn't work out that way. Trade dropped. And when they finished that centre, and when they finished it, Debenhams as it began, or as it was, our trade went up. Went all back up. You couldn't believe it, you know. Because it attracted, having two shopping centres and two departmental stores, 
the people came back. They wasn't going up to London. They wasn't going to Kingston. They were coming back to Croydon because they were getting a selection. And when was the, the change into downfall? Well, in my opinion, it was the last, I would say, the last three years. I left in 2002 because they'd already got rid of all the people that knew how to do the job. I said, John said to me when I told him that I, would, I wouldn't be here this time next year, he said to me, yes, you will. Yeah, you've been here years, you ain't going to leave and all that. I said, well, I am. I said, I've made me mind up. I said, this is going nowhere. I said, the only way this is going, I said, is uh, down. I said, and, you know, I think it's not even going to survive. I wouldn't be certain on that. I said, but it certainly will never be the same again. I said, and I couldn't live with that. I loved this tour. I said, and I've spent half my life in it. I said, and, uh, you know, it means a lot. I said, and for them to come in to do what they thought they were going to do, which they couldn't have done any right, um, I said, it's just taken the heart out of me. I said, so, I said, Jane wants to move, my wife at the time. She was... Um, We'd been burgled while we was on holiday, although my daughter was living there while we were away. And uh, fortunately, we didn't lose too much. But um, she never felt safe in that house again, you see. So she wanted to move. And I wanted a new challenge, and because I wasn't happy there. And I always said, if I ever get to a place where I was not happy, I wouldn't stay. The beautiful thing about all this is all the different jobs that I did, um, I was always happy. When I did all the different jobs, no matter what it was, I was happy. I was doing what I loved. And uh, whether it be the, 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 uh, the side of the deliveries and the whereas, and that, or as I ended up as a salesman in the heavy electrical department, and I know we probably won't have time to go into all that to bring that around, because there's a couple of stories I can tell you there. And uh, they were part of their plan was, which I thought was a disaster. So was, what, what was the reason for that? Was this the management change or the ownership change? No, it was the ownership. What it did was, when Hanson Trust took us over, bless them, I can tell you a funny story there as well, you see. I'll take you back to that. Hanson Trust took us over. Now that's Hanson, Lord Hanson, and his, his business... Um, he owned a brick making company and he had devils and all that. He bought orders at Croydon. No, he bought orders as a, a business, um, which included other shops like Arden and Hobbs. Uh, oh, there was William. Uh, yeah, he, was we, uh, I don't know if we was up. I think, I think we were still under him when we was with William Whiteley's in Bayswater because I went up and helped close them down. Uh we had John Collier's men's were, oh, we had loads of, we even had our own bank at one time, uh, which they got rid of, because um, I think it might have been costing them money in the end. And everything was superb. So Lord Anson takes it all over. He buys it off of the UDS group, Sir Jack Lyons and, and people and that. And nothing really changed to start with. And then we started to see changes. Nobody went, everybody stayed, but we started to see changes. And after, I don't know how long they'd been in charge, but maybe a month or so later on, I had the privilege of serving Lady Hanson with another lady and I can't remember if her name was Booth or something, or White, or something like that. But her husband was also on the board of directors for Hanson Trust. Hanson Trust, it was called. While I was serving them, I was selling them big American fridge freezers. Massive, you know, over a thousand pounds. Um, the ones they had, I think, were about 1,800 quid. 
because while I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I've done the, the sales talk and they've decided. But they're talking amongst each other. And I heard Lady Hanson, and I heard the lady, whatever her other name was, say to Lady Hanson, "Gosh," she said, look at the state of that uniform. Because we had brown jackets and uh, thorny coloured or creamy coloured trousers, brown tie with a little circle with A's, all in sort of an orangey red. Could have bought one in my life. I think I've still got one in my home. She said, they look like people that work for MFI. Lady Hanson says to her, because I'm here, Wigan, well, she said, I'll be having a word with him as soon as I get home. She said, because this is not good enough. She said, this is terrible, she said. And within, I don't know, five or six months, we'd had a new uniform, all chosen by Lady Hanson. Grey trousers, blue jackets, white shirts, nice tie, everything. And they changed everything. They, they, they targeted a time, a, a date, where all the orders stores, some of them that hadn't been called orders before, were renamed. And they had this day where everything was going to be unveiled. We had blue carrier bags, everything. It was amazing. The transition overnight. All the signs outside the store had all been changed, everything. And they, I think, I don't know who opened it, to be honest. It didn't matter. It was a big boost and uh, it was lovely. It was lovely because it brought everybody together. I never wore a jacket half the time because I hated it so much. You know, but when I had the nice blue one, I mean, and the, and the grey trousers and everything, the white shirt, it was lovely. You know, you felt part of something, which, uh, and that was down to Lady Anson. And then it changed. And they, then it was sold to a different company. Well, they sold it to the management. Our own sort of board of directors, of which one of the, the guys, I, don't, I can't remember his name, who was working for Hanson Trust, stayed on uh, as the top boy in orders. I think Hanson kept a few shares at that time, um, but of course his biggest claim to fame, Lord Hanson, was that he bought United Draperies as a whole. He sold off the Richard shops, he sold off your John Collier's, your Alexander's and all that. He kept the Alders brand and, and that made the brand. We had shops duty free in airports, on cruise ships, I mean, it was, it was a thriving business. And uh, for what he got, for all the things that he sold off, paid for everything to buy in the orders group. So he got orders for nothing. For nothing. He didn't pay a penny for orders because he didn't have to. Because the money he'd made on what he stripped, you know, you could argue he stripped some of the assets. But he didn't because he knew that they were you know, they're only going to be short term because they were never, you know, although some of those names are still on the market, but there's others that, that didn't, you know, they, they went by the way. Uh, and Anson was very clever. So he sold it back to the management. And of course, the management were the people that grew with the business. They were people, some of them used to play football for me. You know, I knew them and they knew their stuff because they'd come up as trainees through the system. You know, it wasn't smart Ali brought out of university. You know, I'm not saying they wasn't at university at the time, but they wasn't given jobs, you know, just because they're well educated. They, you know, they had to learn and come through and do it all, and, uh, and they did. And uh, they were brilliant at it. So then it belonged to the management? Yep. And it went well? Yep, it was going all right, and it seemed to be. And when was the change? Uh, that was probably about three years before I left. Um, the company... 99. I can't think what the name of them was. Oh, I know the name. But the company that bought us out was a, a redevelopment company, basically. They were builders. They knew nothing about retail. They didn't want us. They wanted the premises. That's what they wanted. They showed us the plans, which is... A, a, a disagreement, I would say, I got in with one of my colleagues. 
And this is how it went, because they even built a model to show you what was going to happen, what the changes would be. We would move out of orders of Croydon, and we would be moving into a brand new store in St George's Walk. They were knocking St George's Walk down, which they've done, and they were going to build a new orders there. I saw the plants or anything. At the end, on Wellesley Road or Park Lane or whatever the part that bit's called, they're going to have a big bus terminus. All the buses will be coming in and out of there, you know, and we're going to be right next to it. Oh, it was brilliant. So I looked at it and I said to the others that were looking at the same time, I said, that'll never work. So this particular woman, she was a she was the Hoover demonstrator, Janice. She said, "Oh, it'd be brilliant! Oh, yeah, nice new store, everything on one level, and you know, proper way to steer. You go in different floors, and you have to go up and down." I said, "That's part of the character." I said, "But no, this will never work." Yeah, but you've got all the people who come off the buses. I said, "Listen." I said, "If you was a multi-millionaire." I said, and Croydon Council come along to you and said, we want you to open a departmental store. You can choose wherever you'd put it. I said, where do you think people would choose? So she said, well, probably having that new store. I said, no. I said, right here. She said, right here. I said, yeah. She said, but it's old, it's deliberated. I said, it's pretty well kept considering the years that it's been going. I said, and the fact it's been expanding. I said, but this is the best trading place in the whole of Croydon. You couldn't get a better one. So she said, about that? I said, well, the trams come down Jewel Street. They stop right outside the store. I said, all the buses now that they've covered over the, 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 at the front of the store, where it used to be the main road, North End, I said, they all stop at the back of the store. I said, you got East Croydon Station just up the road. I said, you got West Croydon Station just up the road. I said, you got West Croydon bus garage <laughs> just up the road. I said, but the beauty, I said, is the tram. I said, because it stops outside orders, the people get off and come through the arcade. They then walk through orders. They might not stop in orders, but some of them do. The rest go into the Whitgift Centre. I said, where'd they go? They've got to go through orders to get there. I said, you tell me where there's a better place in Croydon. I said, there isn't. I said, this is it. This is it. Well, where this company came unstuck, and there again, if they'd asked the people that worked there, or people like me that knew, uh, they may not have made that silly mistake. Because what they thought they were buying when they bought the building in Croydon, Alders, I mean, they bought the rest, they thought they were going to redevelop it. But they can't. Because a lot of the building has got preservation order on it at any rate. The end where the Whitgift Centre is, is owned by the Whitgift. They ain't going to agree to anything because it's their, if, if anybody's going to do anything, it'll be them. And uh, <laughs> I said, they're never going to get it through. Orders don't own the whole building. They own parts of it, but other parts are owned by other people, other investors. I said, it's a mix match. I said, they never, they never do it. And they never did because they went out of business trying because they, they lost all their money and, and even the company that was overseeing them. I wish I could remember the name of them that brought it out. I said, what they do? They come in. Got rid of all the people that knew how to run the business, the buyers, the middle management, the senior management, all the people that, you know, worked in this, this store and in this trade for many years. I said, they know nothing. All they're after is knocking the building down, redeveloping it and making a lot of money. I said, they can't knock the building down because it's got a preservation order on it. I mean, I knew that because when we had extensions done, we had to go through all this. It's like the Jewel Street, that facade. When they knocked all down behind it, they had to keep that up on scaffolding. It had a bell in it as well. They took the bell down 
and we don't know whatever happened to it. It was supposed to be put back, but it got stolen, and so that never got put back. But uh, but the rest of it stayed, and uh, uh, it was never allowed to be. And there was a lot. Of, plus, you got the arms houses next door. You know, another building that's you know, you know, part of Croydon history. So um, no, I knew I could feel it in my bones that they were born to fail. Logically, in my head. They were born to fail. It was never going to happen. And when I told people that, they said, oh, well, yeah, it will, will. I said, no, it won't. I said, I can tell you it won't. I said, I'll stake my pension. I've got coming on it. I said, <laughs> you see, that was another thing. When I left, I took my pension out of orders and I put it into a, a private scheme, which was on that. And because when they closed down, I then found out from Janice, who said they run off with the pension money as well. I said, they didn't run off with mine. She said, well, they run off with mine. She said, apparently we're going to have to go through the government and get uh, what they think that, uh, you know, we, we're going to get. I said, oh, I said, I hope you do that with me. I said, I'd change mine. I said, I could see where it was all going. I said, and after Maxwell, with the Daily Mirror, he had all their pension fund. I, I wouldn't take any chances. And not only that, I, would, I was going to see whether I could transfer it into my new job when I started. And, I, and the funny thing was, I had a little bit of a leave in do as well, because of the time I'd been there. Uh, management brought me a coffee maker, I think. I asked, no, I didn't ask. Yeah, coffee maker. Um, did everything. It was over £100 at that time, and uh, went up to the club, and different people bought me drinks and that, and uh, I was sad to, to be going, um, but I was pleased in another way because I, I needed to be out, I couldn't stand by, you know, couldn't stand by that. When Terry died, they took over the club, which they had no right to. Legally, we could have done something about that, because it was owned by the staff. It wasn't owned by the company, it was owned by us. It was our money, it was our profits that put the booze behind the bar, it was our money that paid for the staff. They didn't pay for the staff, we did. And uh, I mean, they used their payroll to do it, but we put the money in their payroll to, to do it so that they could you know, get their national insurance stamp and so they could um, Get, you know, join the orders pension scheme and that. But, uh, but no, it, 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 they, they, they were cowboys. They were cowboys, and uh, they didn't know. They didn't. Know. They should have. They should have done what you're doing. Find out the history of orders. Then they wouldn't have gone. They would not have gone into it. I'm sure they wouldn't, because their business heads would have said, "We're walking into a disaster here." Yeah? But if they'd have asked the men that were doing the job, people like me, I could have told them that. You're going the wrong way about it. And if you just think you're going to redevelop Arthur Croydon, you're not. Because the Whitgift Centre will be the first one that will be against you. Because they won't want just, you know, you changing anything. They like having orders at the end of the Whitgift Centre. It pays dividends. It pays dividends for them and it pays dividends for orders. So that was that. I was running the, the goods inwards and the post room and, and Don Ridgely had been and gone and they employed a new controller. Now this new controller was ex-army. I believe he was a captain. I'm not sure of his rank, but he, he was up amongst the officers. Freddie Preston was his name. They told me that he was uh, coming they told me he was there. They told me that he would be my immediate boss because he was going to be the controller of distribution. And that was the transport, the warehouses, dispatch, and goods inwards. And the post room as well, I believe. So he was here three months before he even came and saw me. He turned up one day and he said, oh, Mr. Fisher. I said, yeah. I knew who he was because I'd seen him about. He'd walked past my office millions of times. I said, oh, yeah. 
Yeah. He said, uh, I'm the new controller. He said, Mr. Preston. I said, new controller, Mr. Preston. Oh, I said, you the bloke that started three months ago? He said, yeah. I said, it's taking you this time, I said, to come and introduce yourself to me. He said, I said, even though you're my boss, my immediate boss. He said, well, yeah, but I have a lot of things to, to sort out. I had to go round and see these other people first. He said, anyway, he said, me and you've got to have a meeting. He said, so if you can come to my office, because he had an office there, and he also had an office in warehousing. He said, if you can come to my office, he said, just down there, which was an old, the old dispatch office, the original one when I first started. I said, what time? He said, two o'clock, I said, I'm busy. He said, well, make it up last time. I said, I'm, I'm too busy today. I said, it'll have to be another day. So he said, but I'm your boss. I said, I don't care. I said, if it's taking you three months to come and introduce yourself to me, I said, just as a matter of a courtesy, I said, it will take me a bit of time before I come to your office to talk to you about having a meeting. So I left it a couple of days and I went, when I next saw him and he sitting in his office, I said, oh, I said, I, I'm free this afternoon if you want to have that meeting. And we, we had the meeting, we discussed things, he wanted to know what we did and, and all that, and I told him and all that. And, uh, yeah, it, it was left like that, really. Uh, but he, he never really made sort of any inroads into trying to create a relationship. Um, so uh, I didn't, you know, didn't worry too much about him because most of the time he was out anyway. He wasn't in the store. And then he phoned me up one day. I'd just got married. So that would have been 1975. And... He said to me, he said, ah, oh, Mr. Fisher, he said, just a bloke. He said, I've got a job for you. I said, a job? He said, yeah. I said, I don't want a job. I said, I'm quite happy doing what I'm doing. So he said, no, he said, he said, that you're, what you're doing? He said, yeah, he said, but I want you to do that down here. So I said, what well, goes inwards? I said, well, Hackbridge. He said, yeah, because I hadn't been to Hackbridge. When I shifted back to the store, Hackbridge was being talked about. They were actually looking at it, you know, surveying it, and was ready to make a decision as to whether they were going to have it or not, uh, which they did, but I was away from that at that stage. So um, he said, we're making the manager redundant. Now, I knew the manager because he used to be the transport manager but he'd been put in charge of the new Hackbridge because John, who was originally going to be the manager there, he left for some reason. I'm not quite sure why, but he did. So I said, well, I'm doing the good to him, you know, you know. He said, but I want you to do two other departments as well. So I said, what's that? And he said, radio and TV. He said, and bedding. He said, carpets are coming out because they were there, they're going into a um, distribution warehouse for the whole group, not just for Orders of Croydon. He said, but our stuff will just be for Orders of Croydon. So I said, oh. I said, mm, what's in it, you know, uh, you know, what makes you think I'd want to go there? So he said, well, he said, he said the, the extra responsibilities. He said, um, he said, the only problem is, he said, we can't call you a manager. So I said, you can't call me a manager. I said, I'm a manager now, and you're expecting me to take a demotion? He said, yeah. He said, but it's more money. He said, because you'll be paid as a manager. He said, but we can't call you that because we've got to allow a certain time to go before we can employ a manager again in that. He said, that's why we're having two supervisors. He said, Brian McCluskey's already there, we, who I knew anyway from the original warehousing days. And uh, he said, and hopefully you'll take that. So I said, well, why? You know, what, what makes you think I, I want to do all that? He said, well, it's another five or a week. 
Monday to Friday. He said we we come in Saturdays, you know, sometimes if we need to. He said, uh, but if we do, it's only Saturday morning. He said, so yeah, and it's another five for a week. I said, but you can't call me a manager, you've got to call me a supervisor. I said, for another five or a week, I said, you can call me whatever you like, when do I start? Because I just got married, you know. Five or a week, you know, it wasn't a great deal, but it was, you know, back in 1975. So I went back and, and I did the job for two or three years. I had to keep coming up the store to go to all the different meetings for the different committees and everything I was on. And, uh, and then we fell out. Because he was ex-army, he thought he could just talk to anybody how he liked. Well, sorry, this is Steve Fisher, and nobody talks to me in the way that he did. And we were getting on quite well. I went to, uh, I was doing something on the floor, and, and his secretary wasn't in. And his secretary, he said to his secretary, uh, can you get somebody to come up, you know, whoever it was, you know, whether it be me, Brian McCluskey, or, or anybody else, but mainly it would be me or Brian, or sometimes us both together. So, I don't know whether he didn't know how to use the intercom system, you know, or the, the thing, and uh, he's, so I walk past under the window, going somewhere to do something, check on something, maybe in the delivery bays, see if something particular was there. And uh, he calls out, the window, opens the window and shouts down, and he says, Fisher, come up here. And I thought, I'm not even using the intercom. And he's, so everybody can hear this. So I just ignored it, carried on, doing what I was doing. The next minute he's out again. Fisher, come on up here, now. So I said to myself, Unless he changes his attitude, I won't be out there at all, I'm out now. And all my staff were all right, well, can't you hear that, Steve? I said, yeah, I can hear it. I said, but until he calls me by my proper name, I said, uh, I won't be going up there. Anyway, this carried on for probably about half an hour. Every time I walked past, he shouted and shouted. So in the end, I thought, I've had enough of this. So I go up. I bash his door open. I said to him, you don't ever talk to me like that, particularly in front of my staff. You might be ex flipping army. I said, but you're not in the army now. I said, we deserve respect. I said, if you want to call me, you call me Steve. I said, oh, you call me Mr. Fisher. I said, I'm not one of your subordinates. I said, oh, you can just bully and do what you like. And I put a few cho choice words in amongst that, I'll be honest. I turned, because this only takes seconds. I said, if you want to talk to me, you be, you know, call me Mr. Fisher or Steve. I don't mind which, but I don't answer to anything else. As I turned, the door that I've now smashed open starts to close, and I turn, there's somebody standing behind it. Sonia Twynham, head of personnel. So <laughs> quick as a flash, I said, Ah, oh, Sonia, I'm glad you're there. I said, have a word with him. I said, because he's going to get nowhere, I said, with that attitude. I said, nobody talks to me like he's been talking to me today. I said, I said, so you better have a word. And I marched down. And I went down, carried on with my job, got directing my staff, doing what they're doing, sorting out the problems. She comes down about an hour later. She says, Steve, I've had a word. I said, but you know, it'd be like that. She said, yeah, but he's under pressure at the moment, she said. But he, I've told him he's not to talk to you like that. He's not to talk to anybody like that. I told him what you, you know, I really tell you what you said. He's not in the army now. And, uh, and so we fell out. And after that, he tried to make it really difficult for me. When I was doing my health and safety checks on the warehouses, I had to go to Canterbury Road. And that, it, was, it, was, it all ran smoothly. I turned up one day, there's a new manager. So I said, oh, I introduced myself. I said, I've come round to do me off and save you, Jack. I said, I have to come round once a week. I said, but you're a new manager. I said, so, you know, introduce myself. This is what I'm doing. He said, well, you can't do it now. So I said, 
What do you mean I can't do it now? He said, well, I can't come round with you. I said, you don't have to come round with me. I said, it's, it's for me to do a check on the warehouse, health and safety. I said, it's a legal requirement. He said, well, Mr. Preston's told me that, you know, if it's inconvenient, I'm not to let you in. I said, did he now? So I said, OK, fine. So I jumped back in the car, go back to the warehouse, go in, on the phone, straight away, rings the chairman, uh, um, not the chairman, yeah, it was the chair, uh, no, I ran the secretary to, um, to one of the directors, the, the services director, Jeff Features, I think it was. And I told her, and she said, what? She said, I'll have to have a word with Mr. Reaches about that. So anyway, I didn't hear any more for 20 or 30 minutes or whatever it was. Next minute, my me me phone rings. Ah, it's Mr. Preston here, uh, Mr. Fisher? Oh, yeah. Now, you could see I was in my office because he'd see my office from where I am. He said, uh, can you come up, he said, for a minute. So I said, yeah, OK. Up I goes. He says, now, he said, uh, this problem, he said, that you had with uh, Canterbury Road Warehouse. I said, well, the problem you caused. He said, well, he said he must have misunderstood what I meant. I said, he didn't misunderstand anything. I said, you've got it in for me. I said, but, I said, it's OK. I said, uh, we'll carry on. He said, well, you can go back and do it now, he said. I said, no, I can't. He said, yes, you can. I said, no, I can't. I said, I'll go home in half an hour. I said, I'll do it tomorrow on my way to work. I'll go there first and do it. And because as soon as I went in, the next day, I, f I found things wrong straight away. And uh, normally I'd give them a week to put it right. And what they'd done, what this new manager's done, obviously didn't have a clue, all the high inflammable stuff that the polishers used to use was in this big, it was sort of about that, not quite as big as that, but as wide as that, but not as high, with a lid over the top. It was all the French polish and everything. Everything that, that would burn, would burn, it's in there. He had it moved. And where do you have it moved? Right underneath the fire extinguisher. <laughs> so you'd have to cross over a big fire to get the extinguisher to put him out. So, because that went straight, that got reported straight away, you see, whereas I would have said, get that done. If it's like that next week, you're in trouble. But I'll give you some days to get it sorted. But I didn't, because of the attitude. I just did the report and, uh, and uh, they really got some right telling offs between them. And uh, so I'm back up to the store, going to a staff council meeting in the afternoon. And uh, I was early, so I went and saw my mate Gavin, a small electrical. I see you, Gav. I said, uh, you got any vacancies? He said, no. I said, oh. I said, so you always keep on saying to me, come and work for me. I said, he said, what, do you want to join? He said, what, do you want to come out where I said, I said, yeah. He said, uh, we've got a vacancy. I said, yes, I didn't. He said, I've just created one. <laughs> so I went up. <laughs> I went up to the personnel. He phoned them up and sent me out. And... Uh, they didn't even give me an interview. They all knew me. They said, OK, so yeah, yeah, but you definitely want to come to the store. And I said, yeah. I said, I'm not working for him anymore. I said, I can't work with anybody. Don't show respect. So uh, the next day, he calls me in the office. He said, I've heard you've asked for a transfer. And his attitude was, well, of course, he said, uh, you won't be going until we've got a replacement. He said, that could take months. I said, OK, fine. That's what it takes. I said, I said, uh, Gavin's a mate of mine. I said, he'll, he'll leave the job open. I didn't tell him there wasn't a vacancy in the first place. So uh, after, t after the first week, he was getting pressure from up at the store. I know he was. And uh, he called me in the office on the, the Thursday, I think it was. He said, uh, right, he said, your transfer, he said, it's all been agreed. He said, you can start on Monday. So I rang, went back to my office, rang Gavin up. I said, is that right, Gav? He said, yeah. He said, I'll be expecting to see you Monday. I said, do I go to the person? He said, no, don't worry about all that. He said, come straight in here. 
He said, we all know you. He said, he said what are they going to teach you? So I said, well, I don't know. About transport, how to write out a docket or something, you know. He said, get away. Transfer to what, what position? Just as a salesman. Just as a salesman on commission. Right, so I did that. So Gavin left with a lady he was caught in who was in security, um, a security officer that went round following round um, uh, shoplifters. And they opened a guest house in Hastings. Because I went down to see him one time when he was on holiday. Anyway, I, I worked over under a couple of managers in, in there. And uh, it was great, I was quite happy. Then one day, Len French, who was then made the manager of the heavy electrical department, which was ironic because the fellow before Pat Pickard was always saying to me, even when I was in the why didn't you come and work for me? You make a good salesman. And I'd say, no, no, I'm happy with what I'm doing. I don't want to sell him or all that. Anyway, he came into to me and he said to me, he said, Steve, he said, there's a vacancy coming up in my department. So I said, yeah. So why are you telling me, Len? He said, because I want you to apply for it. He said, it's not been made. The announcement hasn't been made yet. He said, it will be made later today. He said, but I want you to go up now. He said, and put your name down for it. He said, because it'd be bad for you. He said, he said you're selling bigger stuff. He said, you're earning more commission because we've got 1%. He said, you're selling air dryers at seven, eight, nine, ten quid, vacuum cleaners at 50, 60, 70 quid. He said, and now you could be selling machines, you know, 200 quid here and all that, you see. So I thought the logic of it, and I thought, yeah, why not? And small electrical, the staff had changed. So although I got on with them, and they, they were all trained, they, they were all strangers to me in a sense. But in every electrical, I knew a lot of the guys because they'd been there a long time. And I knew them from my dispatch days when they used to come down and say, oh, Steve, you couldn't do a special delivery. You couldn't help me out. Oh, I've cocked up on this. And I, and I used to help them out. So I knew all the guys, most of the guys in there. So I applied for the job. <laughs> David Lloyd, who was the manager, in fact, he was a supervisor at one stage, um, in fact, I remember him as a salesman. He came through the ranks, supervisor and all that, manager. They made him controller, which is when they made Len the manager. No, Len was already the manager. They made him the controller. So he's walking past one day and he says to me, oh, he says, sir. He said, uh, I hear you've applied for the electrical, you know, large electrical job. I said, yeah, yeah, I have, David. Yeah, he said, you won't be getting it. So I said, oh. Why is that in? He said, I've already decided who I'm having. He said, so th there isn't a vacancy. So I said, oh, that's a bad thing. Because it went through my mind straight away. The reason why he doesn't want me is because I'm so well in at the top. Because they didn't want to have this drinking culture that they had being exposed. Although most people knew it was going on anyway. So uh, I said, oh, I said, that's going to be a bit difficult then. He said, why well, is it difficult? I said, because I start on Monday. He said, you don't. He said, I haven't approved it. So I got it. I said, you read that. And it was a letter from personal to say I start because Len had put it in. I want him. I don't want anybody else. That's all I want. And uh, in the end, you've got a good reason for not having him. He said, uh, oh, that's all I want. And because... They said, well, you're the, you're the manager, Len, and that's who you want. You know him, you've known him for years. So, yeah, why not? And I started in there. And because with David, as it turned out, it was an advantage. Yeah, so David eventually got the benefit of me going to his department. Because when I was on the staff council, which I still was, because I got re-elected when I moved into small electrical, when they had their elections, um, I used to go to staff council meetings and we would know because we used to have the meeting with normally Peter Saunders if he, if he wanted to be on that particular. He didn't have to go to every meeting, 
but there was times when he wanted to tell us things. Um, so consequently, you see, we would have that before the managers meeting. So I knew before the managers what was going to be said at their meeting. And David then got on to the, the idea that, to ask me because he knew that if one of the people would invite him out for lunch, a pub lunch normally, whether he should go or not. And I used to say, well, it's about this, that and the other. And he'd say, oh, I don't need to go for that. I can just send me apologies for that. And if it's something a bit more serious, he'd say, oh, I'd have to go for that. So he could make a decision. And, uh, and it allowed him to do everything he wanted to do. So he got an advantage out of that in the end. Uh, because, uh, and the, the problem with me is that in all the jobs that I've done when I, after I was in orders and, and, and when I went on the buses afterwards, is that people find me sort of authoritarian and I don't know why. I used to get customers come in and say, start having a go at me about this, that and the other, wrong delivery, damaged goods, or it just broke down and everything. And I used to say, well, what are you telling me? And they say, well, you're the manager? I say, no, no, I'm a salesman. <laughs> so I'd look at your paperwork. Well, that's the salesman who sold you over there. And I'd say, well, if you want to see the manager, I'll go and get him. And I used to go in the office and get one of the managers out. And they sort of, everybody seemed to think that I was the boss, and I never was, until I left. The last week when I left, they came walking through one of the, the new directors that had been put in by this company, said to me, oh, he said, uh, he said, how would you feel if we made you manager? I said, manager? I said, I'll leave at the end of the week. He said, no, but wouldn't you consider staying if we made you manager? I said, no. I said, I'm moving to Northampton. I said, it's two and a half, I said, it's at least a two hour drive. I said, in normal conditions. I said, in rush hour and things like that. I said, not longer. I said, no chance. No chance at all. I said, thanks for the offer. I said, but no chance. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, uh, I said goodbye to everybody. We had a nice little party and all that. Um, there was a bit of a, a problem that I had. They made me redundant at one stage, illegally. Uh, that was while I was in heavy electrical. Um, they decided they need to cut out some staff. And uh, although I was the longest serving in the whole department, they chose me. Now, I know why they chose me. It was because of the Sports and Social Club. And although I'm not going to say anything here, but I do know quite a lot about certain people in certain positions doing certain things and uh, who could be very embarrassed. And I think that because of that and because one of those people happened to be in personnel, I think that's the reason why I got made redundant. But of course, I said, this isn't right. When I had me, me interview to be, you know, giving me documents and that to say that this is your last day, go and sort your stuff out and, and all that, which was on a Thursday, uh, no, it was a Wednesday, I think. They, uh, I had to see the financial director I saw, who gave me the final file, and I said to him, you're doing, you know, you're breaking the law. He said, no, 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 we're not. No, 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 we've been... I said, I'm telling you, you are breaking the law. He said, what makes you say that? I said, because of all the things that you've logged down on this bit of paper, I said, not one of them applied to me. He said, well, one of them must. I said, they don't. So he said, well, he said, no, he said, uh, you, know, you know, I know you feel sad and all that. He said, but, you know, you know, it's the good of the store and all that. I said, well, I'm telling you. So I went down, I saw, I was in the union then. I said to Jim, I can't think what his other name was. It was the boiler man for, you know, done maintenance around the, the store. He was the fellow in charge of, you know, at the union. I said to him, Jim, I said, uh, I've been paying all this money to you. And I said, now it's your 
chance to work for me. He said, what's that? I said, well, I've been made redundant. He said, yeah. I said, well, I want you to get onto your legal team. I said, then fight my corner. He said, well, there's no point. He said, we've agreed to it all. He said, uh, I said, but they're breaking the law, Jim. No, 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 we've had our top people look at it and all that. And said, no, 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 they're all legit. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll get onto a solicitor. So I get into the solicitor's office after turning up on the doorstep. They, they ring up the solicitor and to, to see if he can see me. I walked in. I said, he said, oh, what can I do for you? I said, well, I said, uh, I've got a problem with orders of Croydon. He went, stop there. I said, stop where? He said, don't say any more. I said, why? He said, we represent orders of Croydon. He said, come talk to us about it. He said, he said, there's, there's another solicitor down the road. So I went down there, spoke to them, uh, and they said, well, yeah, we think, you, we think we'd, you know, we'd have to have more detail. I said, well, I just want to see whether I could, I don't want to do anything at the moment. I want to see about, you know, what was going. So, um, anyway, I was at home the next morning after I'd been made redundant. Knock at the door. I thought, who's that? It's a fella, Martin. I can't think what his name was. He was, um, he was put in charge of customer services. Martin. Oh, God, I wish I could remember his other name. I do know it, it's just I can't remember. And uh, he'd left to go and work for Peter Saunders, because Peter Saunders left the business to become uh, something on Peter Saunders left the business to become working for Croydon Cable TV. I think it was an American company that actually owned it. And he'd got Martin, because he'd heard about the redundancies, he got Martin to come round who was working for him, as a, one of the managers, I think, uh, to knock on my door to say, Steve, come and work for us. Just like that. I said... Well, he said, Peter Saunders is sent me around. He wants you. Come and work for him. So I said, I can't do it. I said, I really can't do it, Martin. I said, Martin Rue was his name. I said, I can't. I said, what you want me to do is selling, isn't it? He said, yeah. I said, but it's cold calling. I said, it's knocking on people's doors. Get them to have cord and cable TV. He said, yeah, exactly. I said, I can't do cold knocking on people's doors. I said, oh, I said, no, I, I said, I only need to talk to people that actually are interested. I said, I couldn't be standing on doorsteps banging on and, you know, and say, I need to be told, sorry, but no, nah, no thanks. You know, I said, it's just not me. I said, thank Mr Saunders. I said, really, really thank him. I said, because it does mean a lot. And... Uh, and the same day I went up to the uh, employment office because I thought, well, I've got to sign on because I hadn't got a job. Um, I wasn't even thinking about getting a job at that time because I'd been paid redundancy. I, I was reasonably well off. And I thought, but they're not stamping my card anymore. You know, that's going to affect my pension or possibly. So I've gone up to there, I queued up, this desk, the unemployment, got to her, she said, oh yeah, what can we do for you, you know, and all that. I said, well, I said, uh, I need to sign on, I said, because I need to get the stamp, I said, because I've been made redundant. So she said, you've been made redundant. She said, who do you work for now? I said, oh, this, oh, right, she said, hang on. She pointed across the other side, she said, see that lady over there? And she gave him a, a name. I said, yeah, she's dealing with all the orders staff. She's not dealing with anybody else, only orders. So I said, oh, very nice. 
So I went over to this lady, said, you know, and she said, you're ex-orders. So I said, yeah. So she said, and you were made redundant. She said, well, I can tell you now. She said, the staff at orders are exceptional. She said, and everyone that's been made redundant that wants a job, we will have no problem at all finding them a job because all the staff are well respected in Croydon. You'll have no troubles at all. She said, but let, let's, you know, sit down and let's talk about the redundancy. So I said, well, I said, as far as I know, I said, I shouldn't have been made redundant. So she said, well, she said, I've got the list here. She said, of all the reasons you would have been made redundant. She said, also, because it was over 100 people, she said they have to register it with the employment department as of the government or something. So I said, what does that mean? She said, well, she said they have to give all the reasons. She said, and here's all the reasons here. So I said, but none of them apply to me. So she said, well, let's go through them. So we sat there, we went through all these reasons. So I said, no. So I said, no. So I said, no. No, 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 no. But she said, there must be one of those. I said, there's not. She said, but well, they're breaking the law then. I said, I keep telling people that, but nobody will believe me. So she said, well, she said, I've never. She said, what makes you think you shouldn't have been done then? I said, well, it says on that bit of paper, and you've just told me that it's registered with the Department of Employment. That was what it was. She said, yeah. I said, but it says there. I said, that if you're past retirement age, I said, you go. I said, rather than making somebody unemployed that shouldn't be unemployed. She said, well, yeah. So she said, so how does that affect you? I said, because as a person, I said, that came into our department, I said, he's working in there. I said, called Chris Cherry. I said, and he's still working there. I said, and he's retired. She said, well, how do you know he's retired? I said, because he used to work for Curry's. I said, and we used to occasionally have a bit of lunch or a coffee together. I said, because he was always, he comes to work on a push bike. I said, and as he's riding along the roads, he said quite often he, he picks money up that's coins in the road. He said, and he's always got enough to buy free coffees for each of us. I said, and he told me that he was retired because I wanted to get something from Curry's and he said, well, I can get him a staff discount because I get a percentage off. I don't know, I can't remember what it was. I, it was binoculars that I wanted that you could use in the night, you know, because I wanted to look at the wildlife and that. And uh, so I said, and he told me he still gets his discount even though he's retired. And what happened was, as it turned out, was that when he came for the job, he spoke to a guy, he knew that he worked in countries. And instead of putting his right age down, he actually put it down less than what it was. So that the personnel department always thought that, uh, that it was legit, but it wasn't. And because I knew it wasn't. So I'm now, having another leaving do over the tavern in the town, I think it was. Just with the people I worked with. And uh, they said, the assistant manager, used to be the assistant manager in Aerodactyl, had gone down to Sutton as the assistant manager there in the, um, oh, what do you call it? It was a, a bargain shop. What they were doing is because what was Shinners of Sun became Alders of Sun. They were moving it down to a shopping centre had just been built. They got a specially built store. And and they'd open up this um, shop opposite to sell off, you know, old stock and things like that. But because it was such a success, it um, was brought over to, to the, the um, God, I can't remember the word for it, for that store. And uh, Lee, who was the assistant manager, he said to me, why don't you come and work for us? He said, it'd be a temporary contract. He said, but, you know, tide you over. 
So I said, yeah, all right, then go on in. Uh, so I went down to the Sutton quarters, had a short interview, and I said, we don't know why. We've, we've got your records here. You know, we've had them moved, brought over. She said, there's no reason, we, you know, we're not going to say yes. Uh, so it was a case of when can you start? I said, as soon as you like, because I'm not working. So I worked in there for a little bit, and, um, and I'll tell you a little bit of funny story about that quickly, not now. Eric, who was the man here, I'm now seeing this, going back to see the solicitor to start a legal battle against orders. Eric says to me, they want to see you up the store. So I said, who wants to see me up the store? He said, Peter Danes. So I said, oh, all right. What's he want that for? They want to talk to you. I said, but I'm going to meet solicitors that day because it was my day off. I said, he said, what are you going to do this? I said, I'm taking my call. I said, what they've done is illegal. I said, I'm not very happy about it. I said, considering all the work I've put in, because this is after Terry had died, you see, and because uh, it would never have happened if Terry had still been there, and if Peter Saunders had still been there, it would never have happened. So they said, well, yeah, I think it's to your advantage. They wouldn't tell me what it was about. I think it's your advantage. So anyway, on the relevant day, I go into orders and I'm early. So I go to the, the uh, office, electrical office, to take young Karen, who was the supervisor, out for a coffee. She said, I'm glad I seen you. I said, why? She said, well, she said, I've been looking for you. It was only when somebody said clearance centre. Somebody said you he was working down the clearance centre in something, that they knew where to get you. She said, they're right up in arms. So I said, why? She said, well, I happen to be up in personnel, she said. And one of the women was talking on the phone. She said, I was here, Wigan, you know, you do what I was waiting to see somebody. And your name was mentioned. So the conversation, she could only hear one side. But she worked out that she thinks it was the inland revenue. Tax man. So she puts the phone down and says to one of her colleagues, does anybody know where Steve Fisher is? We made an almighty clangor here. Now I know why I'm being called up the store. So I go and see Peter Danes, and uh, he, you know, he laid his cards on the table. I laid my cards on the table. I got on with Peter at any rate. And uh, he was another director or after it that I told off for not doing his job once. We got on all right. And uh, we, we, we chatted and all that, and I said, well, I have to think about all this. I said, because as far as I'm concerned, you know, you, you've paid me off. He said, well, we'll have that back. I said, you won't, I spent it. I hadn't spent it at all. I invested it. So he said, well, he said, uh, that could cause a problem then, because you'd have to pay tax on it if you come back. I said, well, I won't have to come back. I said, I'll just carry on with me, me legal. So he said, oh, well, we don't really need to be doing that. I said, well, yeah, we do. I said, you don't realise how much this has hurt me. I said, forget about everything else. I said, but I love this place. I said, and you listen to somebody else that don't know what they're talking about. I said, you destroyed me. I said, so no. I said, I'm going to have to think a lot about this. So anyway, we arranged another meeting. So I went, I was still working down the clearance centre. I went back, saw Peter. He said, so uh, let's chat up some more about it. So we come back. He said, well, he said, we can, we can get over the money side of it, he said, by saying that you left and then we reinstated you. You know, you you reapplied for your job. He said, we can, you ain't got to do that. He said, but we can say that. He said, then you won't have to pay money on the a tax on the money. So I said, yeah. So he said, but we've got to make it look as if you've left. So I said, yeah. I said, so that money then, I said, is my compensation then, isn't it? He said, well, between us, he said, yeah. 
So I asked, so he said, but we're going to have to show that you've had a break. He said, so what I'm going to do is put you down that you work down the clearance centre um, and, that, and then you transferred back. He said, so that period that you wasn't working in between, we're going to put that down as, you know, you wasn't working. So he said, the only thing is we're going to show that, he said, in some material way. And I said, well, what's that? going to do that then? He says, your discount. He said, we'll refer it back to 15% because I used to get 20. Um, he said for, I think it was six months, he said, then we'll put it back up to what it should be. I said, yeah. I said, but what about my five weeks holiday? He said, well, if you've left and restarted, he said, you're not entitled to five weeks, you're entitled to four. I said, yeah. But, you know, I don't see why after all the years I've worked here that I can't have my five weeks holiday because the extra week was because you long service. So he said, well, what we can do about that is we'll have to show you that you don't have it this year. He said, and because uh, I've already been paid all my holiday money at any rate. So technically I'd had, had it. Um, he said, we can't change, pay it this year, he said, but from next year, he said, when it starts, you know, to occur, he said, we'll put it back on. I said, fine. And then when I came back, and then he told me about the new manager that we got, a bloke, Stan, somebody, who'd come from Selfridges. Oh, he, he was going to be the, you know, the saviour. He was going to do everything right, and he was this and he was that. So uh, I said, oh, he, yeah, he starts this Monday. I said, well, I'm not leaving Eric in the lurch. I said, I'll come back. I said, when he's got a replacement. I said, because they've been good to me down there. I said, we got on well. We've had some laughs. And he said, oh, no, he said, that's fair. He said, it's really good here. I said, well, why not? So I go back, <laughs> tell Eric what's happened the next day. And he says to me, yeah, I knew all along about this, he said. He said, Lee told me that you always thought it was illegal. He said, and as it turns out, it was. He said, but I couldn't tell you. He said, I wasn't allowed to. I said, that's all right. I said, but I'm going to work until they find a replacement. Oh, he said, that's decent. I said, yeah, great. He said, oh, it's been nice. He said, I don't want to lose you, really. He said, because you're good at what you do. And uh, one of the things I did was we bought in a load of co-op milk saucepans. We were knocking them out of 50 pence. I think we were knocking them out of 50 pence. All stacked up here, boxes on there, a few loose ones on the top. We had them there for three or four days, sold about two. So he said to me, why are they selling? It's one of your departments, because I had about three or four different departments I had to look after. So I said, well, I said, two reasons. I said, they're in a box. I said, they're too cheap. He said, don't be daft. He said, they're good quality socks. Well, they come up, well, they got come up on the box. I said, I'm telling you, Eric. He said, well, prove me wrong. So up just past his office, near the door, they had a big counter with all this mix and match stuff on it, just chucked on, but everything that was on there was a pound. So I unboxed three of these saucepans. I take them out, I just chuck them on there. Within 10 minutes, they were sold. Get some more, I'll chuck them on there. they would gone. So uh, I said to Eric, I said, don't you have to do a markup when we sell something more than what it's actually supposed to be sold? He said, yeah. I said, well, can you put down six of them swordsmen? I said, because I've got a pound each from them. You what? How would you get a pound each from them? I said, because I told you. They're worth a pound. They're good quality. People will buy them, but they don't want to see them stacked up like that. They like the rummage. And we sold the rest all within about a week and a half. But the funny story was... But that was when you went back to, to that, work that, for all those... Well, no, you, well, yeah, but I was working at the clearance centre in Sutton. He said to me on my last day... What means last day? When I was going back to orders. That was a, a Saturday, because uh, I'd agreed to... to well, they got a replacement. Mm. The replacement was Chris Cherry, the fellow that was being kept on orders. They got him in the office and said, you can't no longer work here because we should have got rid of you. But there's this job at 
clearance centre in Sutton that you can have and we'll just swap you around. So he was quite happy about that because me and him got on all right. And uh, so on my last day, I go into the FS, said to Eric, well, I said, you'll be seeing the back of me today. He said, yeah, he said, he said, uh, you better know when he worked hard, he said, we need to get some money in the till, you know. He was a smashing guy. He was Indian or I don't know. But he was a great guy. And uh, I go to my departments. So I'm in charge of housewares or hardware, um, large electrical and small electrical, radio and TV. I go around and look around my departments, make sure everything's nice and everything. That was back in all those. No, this is in the clearance centre, my last day. The last day, okay. I go around. I look at, um, everything's fine. I go round to the radio and TV and in the middle of the floor is this massive blanket. On top of this massive blanket is a chandelier, a big one. I'm over to Eric, I said, what's the game? Why you dump that bloody old rubbish in from there? You know, how are people gonna get past it? He said, before you go, I want you to sell that. I said, how much is it? He said, £999. I said, you're talking £1,000? I said, for that heap of junk on the floor. I said, not even I could sell that. He said, I thought you was good. I said, not that good. So, <laughs> he says, I said to him, where's it come from? He said, well, it was in the older store opposite. He said, when you used to walk in the store, there was a big chandelier up there. He said, they took it down. He said, last night, he said, and they, after we got home, he said, they brought it in. He said, and they dumped it over there. He said, they told me they were going to do it. I said, well, I've got to get all work all around. I said, you've got no choice. At any rate, I couldn't believe my luck. This couple come in, they're middle-aged, chatting to them. We come from a washing machine. I said, oh, right. I said, well, I can do that. So they said, oh, we want a tumble driver as well. I said, oh, I can do that. They said, shame about shit, because they called it Chinners, what was the original. Shame about Chinners, she said. We used to spend thousands in there, she said. We used to shop in there. We, we, everything we bought for the old house, furniture, everything, carpets, the work, you name it, we bought it. We had it from that shop. She said, we're so sorry that it's closed and they've now moved it down because it hasn't got the character. It's a nice new store and it's lovely, but it, it's not what, we spent years going in that shop. So anyway, we get onto the washing machine, we do that, we do the tumble dryer. She then says, oh, we need a little fridge. So I show them the little fridges. Yeah, we'll have that one. Have you got any videos? Videos? What, VHS players, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, we've got some. I said, that's my department as well, I'll take you around. I said, but be careful, I said, because there's a load of junk on the floor. I said, we'll go around the other way. So I go around, I sell them a television set and I sell them a VH VHS recorder. She says, that looks familiar. So he says, well, isn't that the one that was hanging up as we used to go and we used to admire it. I said, well, if you're talking about the one from across the road, I said, yeah, it's that one. I said, right, eat my jump. He said, how much is it? I said, 999 pounds, 1,000 quid. I said, oh, God. He said, we'll have it. I said, what? He said, we'll have it. He said, we've always loved that. He said, we'll have it. Now, because this thing's worth a few thousand, but I mean, it's been up there years. So... I have to write different dockets for the different department. I get the, way, the delivery, find out what the next delivery is, it's Wednesday, so that's great. So what I did was, I gave Eric the delivery paper, well, the dockets, for all the electrical stuff except the chandelier. So he said to me, he kept saying to me, if you sold that chandelier, I said, you got no chance. Anyway, about four o'clock in the afternoon, I get called in the office. There's a few of the staff in there. Just wanted, they got a bottle of wine and we'd 
they all had a you know, little glass, not much. And they said, we just want the toaster and wish you well when you get back to you know, your proper job and all that. So I said, oh, yeah, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, you know, nice. Aren't we giving you a couple of little presents? They bought me some shirts. Well, they got them out of stock, but I, I don't know how they paid for them. It's not my problem. And all that. He said. And Eric sent me, he said, uh, he said, um, did you enjoy working here? I said, I loved it, Eric. I said, not just for you, I said, but the staff, I said, they're all tremendous. I said, really nice. And he said, well, we, we bought you a little thing, you know, a couple of bits, and that's what they did. So he said, you sold that chandelier? I said, no. I said, but I, I said, well, I'll be honest. I said, yes, I have. So I sold it this morning. He said, what do you mean you sold it this morning? I said, well, there's good news and there's bad news. He said, what's the good news then? I said, well, I sold it. He said, no, you haven't. I haven't seen any paperwork. I went, here's your paperwork. He went, you have. He said, what's the bad news? I said, do you remember I bought in that tumble dryer and radio and TV stuff? He said, yeah. I said, well, it's for the same customer. I said, they insist on that, eh? He said, and that's bad news. I said, yeah. I said, because I leave today to go back to Croydon. I said, and somebody's got to wrap that up. <laughs> yeah, so I left there on a high. Uh, he said, well, you could come back and do it. I said, no, I can't. <laughs> but anyway, when I turned up on the Monday morning at orders, back in my old job, there again, I went up to the personnel and said, well, I'm back. We don't want to see you. We know you. We know you were coming back. Oh, go back down. You know what you've got to do. There's nothing we can teach you. You've done it all. You've, you've done the job. It's, it's easy. So I walk in and I see this new manager. Stan. I can't remember his other name. But it doesn't matter. So I went in. I said to, He said to me, oh, he said, you're the new boy that's come back. So I said, yes, Stan. I said, I am. I said, I've heard all about you, I said, from Peter Danes. He said, my name's not Stan to you, it's, and he used his surname, I can't remember what it was. So I said, sorry? He said, you call me Mr. Whatever. I said, okay, fine, not a problem. That's what you want. I went outside, talked to the lad. They said, we all call him Stan. So, he said, he's a bit of a shady character. I said, it seems to me like he's a bit of a barrow boy, which I was proved to be right. So we do a, a late night dishwashing night. And after it had finished, Peter Danes said, you know, it's been such a success. If anybody, anybody wants to come up to the club and I'll buy him a drink. So most of us went up, got a drink on him. He went and sat down talking to different people. I didn't go back up to the bar because i will get myself another drink if I'm buying around. And stands there. And he says to me, well, he said, he said, you were lucky, he said. So I said, what do you mean I was lucky? He said, well, if it weren't for me, you'd never have got your job back here. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, it was me. It was down to me that you came back. I said, you're talking out of your ass. I said, the reason I came back, I said, is that man sitting down there, Peter Danes? I said, we'd agreed that I was coming back before you'd even joined the company. It was only because I'd stayed at the clearance centre that, um, that uh, you know, that you, I wasn't here when you started. So he said, no, nah, no, nah. I said, yeah. And that's when I realised he was a liar. A few days later, well, yeah, probably a week later, the assistant manager, Delroy, uh, who was a black bloke, uh, he was a smashing guy, he was a Christian, he used to go to church, and all. his wife was one of the managers up in the catering department. He's putting out, he, he's got these signs, and Stan says to him, Delroy, I want all these signs up by lunchtime. So he says to Delroy, and it says to Stan, he says, I can't put them up, Stan. They're not within the company's policy. He said, we're not allowed to put them up. He said, I'm the manager. He said, I'm telling you, put them up. 
So Delroy said, we're not supposed to. He said, but on your head be it. He said, do as you're told. So Delroy starts putting these notices up, these hangs from the ceiling. He got about four, maybe five up. One of the directors walked through, called Stan over. Stan, why is he putting them up? They're not in keeping with the company policy. We don't use them sort of things. You know, it's all wrong. They, they've got to come down. So he shouts across to, to Delroy, right across the shop floor, Delroy, what are you putting them up for? I told you those wouldn't be. They wasn't to be put up. You know they're against the company policy. I thought, I don't believe this. So, sadly, although it wasn't my hand, sadly, he didn't last much long after that. You couldn't trust him. If he was doing that, what was he doing with everybody else? So, we got a bit on him. Uh, and what he done was he, 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 he sold two people, one being his girlfriend, um, some electrical items below cost price. Made the salespeople that were doing the orders put it, you know, down at that particular price, and uh, and they, knowing what he was like, got him to sign the bills. So he authorised them, and uh, and then one of the salesmen took it all up to security, and uh, he didn't last very long after that. But he was a dangerous man, a very dangerous man. But how did you, and then you, you left. Well, then I came back to, to the, the, all, the, electrical, uh, the electrical department, the heavy electrical, and worked there, I don't know, probably another 10 years, I don't know, uh, to 2002. And, uh, and then, oh, I wish I could remember this name. Minerva is the name of the company that bought them. And because uh, I was into selling and buying and selling stocks and shares, so I knew a little bit about companies and I knew how to get the background. You know, and uh, and I looked them up because I wasn't happy with them what they were doing, and, and I could see that they were basically they were just builders, you know. And then and then you got to that, and, or you you gave in the notice in the end. Yeah, I gave in the under. Yeah, I, because the notice, you gave in the notice. Yeah, it, in um, was must have been Christmas two thousand and one. Um, because I was saying to John, one of my colleagues, John Matthews, I said, uh, we were talking and all that, and I said, uh, well, I said, I'm going to enjoy it this year. I said, because I won't be here this time next year. I decided to leave orders um, and move away because it was a joint decision between me and my wife. Um, as I say, she lost confidence in that, living in central Croydon. Um, we'd been burgled while we were away, although we didn't lose too much. But she didn't feel safe in Croydon anymore. And uh, so uh, we decided that we would look for another accommodation. We was either going to, uh, and I was so, you know, upset of the way things were going at orders that I needed a new, I needed a new job, I needed a change. Uh, and I wanted something totally different. So I became a bus driver up in Northamptonshire. We, um, that's when... Why, that's why you still live in this area? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, uh, my, my eldest daughter lived in Northamptonshire. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was a toss up between moving to Eastbourne, where my youngest daughter lived, or moving to Northamptonshire in a place where we lived called Thrapston. Um, Bought a lovely house there, a beautiful house, and uh, and and doing something different. So I applied for two jobs. I applied one was for on the trains, um, and the other was on the buses. I wanted something that was outdoors, because you know I'd been working inside all you know a lot of my life, and uh, and I thought I really needed a change, a change of direction. So. Um, I left in 2002. I, I worked, I think I did a month's notice. In fact, we'd already moved to Northamptonshire and I was staying with my mum at Wallington until um, I'd got everything settled down here, and uh, which is what I did. 
I got a job on the, the buses, at, uh, and there again, through orders, influence, if you like, because of the different jobs I did at orders and different things, I went as a driver, uh, trained, learned how to drive a bus and everything, did that for, so, and then I worked on what they called the Weetabix rotor, which was just ferrying Weetabix staff in uh, a Burton Latimer at uh, the factory because uh, they was working 24 hours a day, the, the factory was. Uh, and I was quite enjoying it, you know, out on the road, your own boss sort of thing, a lot of responsibility. Uh, then they put me on um, a different road, huh? Um, well, we lost the, we lost the, the, uh, the contract for the road, huh? that's why I went on to it. And I went on the Market Harbour, which was lovely. I loved that, because what it meant was that... Uh, you worked five days a week. Uh, no, sorry, you worked four days a week, but you did long shifts. And every third week, it meant that because the d days off were rolling, you got a whole week off, virtually, you know, because you got a six-day week before you started, uh, you know, six days off before you started again, which I loved. But then the manager, uh, like called Brian Haddon, found out that... Uh, I knew a little bit about computers because having done them in orders, being an administrator for them and training the staff, I used to go to next door when that became head office to training to, I uh, can't think what her name was because she used to work in her department once. Um, and they, they would train me and, and other members of staff. We would then go back and train the staff on the shop floor. So that was a thing that I did, and he found out about this. So he got me working inside for little jobs to cover staff that was there. I ended up doing the detailing at times, which meant that I had to make sure there was drivers on every bus for every route and everything. Then he decided that... Uh, um, then I went on to school runs, which was handy because the bus was kept to where I lived, in what they called an outstation. And I used to work Monday to Friday, which was great. Uh, but in the afternoon, or in the, 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 the second half of the morning and the first part of the afternoon, I used to go and work in the cash office with a lady um, who subsequently died of cancer, sadly. And um, we worked quite well together. And then he said to me one day, oh, we need somebody to learn the wages to cover for that. So I... I did that as well. And uh, th th as it turned out, it was good for me because I could still go out bus driving, but I didn't do much of that then in the later stages. Um, because <laughs> the guys that I were covering, or the girl, in one case the, the woman I was covering, um, allowed me to choose my own holidays. Because as a bus driver, you don't choose your own holidays, they do. And then it's up to you to change it with somebody else that's got the time off that you want. Uh, which I try to t talk them out of doing it that way. Much better for everybody just to put their names down for that. And if there's no spaces left, then sorry, you can't have them. You know, but that meant everybody could have the, what they wanted. My time in orders was simply, it was an education. It was an education. I learned more working for orders, various things, things that I never knew anything about and became quite proficient in, simply because of them. Simply because of them. They were um, the people. That, uh, it, it was just one happy family, particularly when we had Tim Daniels and, uh, uh, and Peter Slaymaker as directors there. Um, but even, the other, I mean, I was fortunate I got on well with them. I mean, after Peter Slaymaker retired, uh, there, there was um, another fella, he was a, he was a buyer but in, in, uh, for uh, garden furniture and housewares, Owen Brookwing. When they used to walk through the store after they retired, they used to come to me and have a chat, and they'd be saying, have you seen Peter Slaymaker lately? Oh, yeah, he was in last week. Oh, well, next time, can you tell him to ring me? And then Peter Slaymaker would come in a couple of months later and I said, I said, Owen, he says, he wants you to ring him. Oh, yeah, I'll ring him. 
And then next time I'll see Owen, he'd say, you haven't rung me. <laughs> and, but it was nice that these, these guys that, that, that were quite well up in the company, you know, still had time to talk to me, which Peter Saunders did. Peter Saunders came in one day uh, with his wife and, uh, and I said, oh, well, he said, y y I heard you got back, he said, after you. He said, oh, they messed that up, didn't they? I said, yeah, they did. I thanked him for thinking of me, sending Martin round. And uh, we had quite a lengthy chat, actually, about it all. And uh, he said, uh, well, he said, he said, you're set here for life, then, aren't you? I said, yeah, I probably am, because things changed when the company changed. But, uh, but he was nice, because you could, you see, these guys you could talk to, you know. You could tell them things, and, you know, and, and, and ask them things. They were, they were so approachable. And most of the management were always like that whenever I, all the years I worked there. They were, you know, they weren't just your bosses. They were sort of, they were colleagues, you know, and, and most of them treated you that way. It was the old school that were a little bit different, but then that's because they were the old school. Last question. Uh, possibly you know that all those buildings are still there. Yeah. I saw it as I came past. Oh, you, you I, I walked past it. Oh, you want well, I had to because I wanted to have another look, okay. but, but it's all mouldy, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. empty here. Yeah, uh, which saddens me. What, yes. what would you imagine for the future to happen with this building? Well, I, I really don't know because retail in general is suffering, I know that. So, you know, and of course, there are other things about that building that people don't know, like part of it used to be a cinema. Somebody came up on Facebook, the, the orders thing, the other day and said this is, there was a chapel in there. Now, I never knew about a chapel, ever. Never knew it. But there's people saying, yeah, oh yeah, it was up on the second floor or whatever it was, I don't know. And, uh, and I suppose nobody ever talks about the ghost, which I've seen. Okay. Up the club happened on two occasions for me up the club we've closed down we're just having a pint before we go home we used to wait until the security men come up to lock all the upstairs doors so that you couldn't get out onto the balcony or anything because it was very nice in the summer and I'm talking to Terry and Steve Pennell I think was there as well and I saw somebody walk across and I sort of looked again and I watched them walk across. And I said, somebody's up here. I said, it's not security. I said, because they've been up and gone. He said, no, he said, there's nobody up here, can't be. I said, I'm telling you, I saw them. We were chatting, not like we're chatting now. So it wasn't a case of that I was thinking. And we wasn't drunk or anything like that because we'd only had a couple of pints because we'd been very busy that night. And we'd, you know, when we were working, as such, even though we weren't getting paid for it. Um, we never drank, you know, we might have a half a lager on the side and that would be it, We'd nothing else. Not until afterwards, then we'd have a couple of pints. So I went and had a look, and of course there was nobody there. And I thought, am I seeing things or not? So I thought, no, nah, anyway, I, I, I dismissed it. Then. Some time later, I couldn't tell you, it might have been a year later or whatever. I said uh, to Terry, I said, oh, I said, the security boy, so I said, they're up doing the doors. He said, I said, shall we, because sometimes we used to leave him a couple of pints at them, unofficially. And uh, he said, no, he said, he said, they've already been. He said, I told them we'd leave a couple of pints out for them. I said, I've just seen one of them walk across the door. He said, you haven't? I said, I did. So I had a look again, and I went over to the door, because the door was locked. So they must have been up, because of, well, I never saw them, but I saw this. So the next night, and they would come and do their thing, I said, hey, I said, is there a ghost here? Oh, don't talk to us about the ghost, they said. We see it quite often. So I said, well, how do you know it's a ghost? They said, we could tell you many stories, but we'll tell you this one. 
He said he went down and was doing a furniture floor, second floor, he said, and he saw somebody go into Dave Proctor's office. Now Dave Proctor's office was in the middle of the furniture floor and it was surrounded by furniture. There was no other entrance other than the one door. He got closer, he said, tell him what happened. He said, well, I got closer. He said, and I shouted, come on you in there, come on out. He said, and there was no answer. He said, look, I know you're in there. He said, I see you go in. There was still no answer. So he radios through to his mate and says, you better come down here because there's somebody in the office. He said, bring the dog. Well, they had an Alsatian, a uh, German Shepherd, police trained, I believe. I know they used to keep one on the, the roof when I first started. So they got there and he said, well, he's definitely in there. He said, he ain't come out. He said, he can't have. So they decided that they would go and try the door and put the dog in. But they didn't. They tried the door and it was locked. So they went back down, one of them went back down, you stay here with the dog and keep an eye. One went back and got the keys to unlock it. They unlock it. They went to put the dog in, say, go and in you go. The dog turned around and walked away. When they looked in the office, there was nobody there. <laughs> 